The Board of Education will come to order at this time. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? I move to enter into executive session to discuss personnel, collective bargaining, or legal property acquisition issues and student issues. Maryland Local Government Code Article Section 9-512A, 1, 2, 6, and 10. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. The board will now enter into executive session. I'll see you. The board will reconvene at this time. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Education meeting. Please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Moving along, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Okay. <clears throat> We have a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the ayes have it. Board reports. Sarita? Um, I'd like to talk about the, the first day of school and just how everything went. Um, generally, everyone was pretty enthusiastic about being back at school, there's a lot of good energy throughout the halls. Um, more in the classrooms, we met all of our teachers if we hadn't done so at open house. Um, and we started to turn in or review our summer assignments, which we love so dearly. <laughs> <laughs> and ad additionally, we returned to our various after school activities. Uh, thank you very much. Mrs. Crosby. Um, I enjoyed my first day visits to um, Esperanza, Carver, and Green Holly, which is right over by where I live. Uh, at Esperanza, I, we went to, oh, and I also need to mention uh, Dr. Ridgell and Mrs., Mrs. Charbonnet went with us. And at Esperanza, I met one of my son's good friends, Mikey McDivitt, and saw his nice classroom that was not overly populated, which I think is very important to have small classes. It was very, the kids were bright <coughs> and shiny and ready to go. Oh, okay. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Matthews. Yes, sir. I'd also like to talk about my first day of school. We took a tour. It was Dr. Jeff Mayer with myself, Miss Kim Howe, Delegate Johnny Woods, and Commissioner Dan Morris, and Mr. Ashley Warner. Um, we started out the day at Chopticon High School, and it was, and we finished the day. We did Letty Marshall Dent, White Marsh Elementary, Benjamin Banneker, and Dinard. Um, usually, when we do the first day of schools, I usually see some tears, and I see nothing but happy faces. The only time I saw some stress was in Chopticon's hallway. There were a couple kids that didn't show up for the open house, and their eyes were about this big, going, "I'm a freshman, and where do I go?" But it was a great time. That sounds like a bumper sticker. <laughs> it was a t-shirt. <laughs> it should. We, we had a good time. It was a nice day, and everybody was on task. And 
there were no tears. It was absolutely wonderful going through all the elementary schools and all the happy kids. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Mrs. Walsh. Thank you, Dr. Rasper. This is the most exciting time of the school year. <coughs> Students are back in school and they are excited and so are their parents and the teachers. I want to thank the many individuals, civic, business, faith-based communities, and philanthropic organizations who collected school supplies for our students. This is a tremendous help to families who struggle to make ends meet. Even though we live in a somewhat affluent community, there are many residents who are the working poor, unemployed, underemployed, and homeless. I know they and their children sincerely appreciated the gifts of caring and thoughtfulness. Not only were school supplies collected, but many churches and organizations sponsored back-to-school rallies. For example, First Missionary Baptist Church, under the leadership of Pat, uh, Pastor Roderick McClanahan, held a back-to-school rally on Wednesday, August 13th. Over 100 people were in attendance. Students were given backpacks and shopping bags stuffed with a variety of school supplies. In addition, they offer an after-school tutoring program for all ages. Dr. Curtis Austin, principal at George Washington Carver Elementary School, and I were keynote speakers, and our job was to give our best advice to students to start their school year off in the best way. Dr. Austin's speech focused on why we go to school. He said it is to fulfill our purpose. I spoke from a Christian perspective and told the students to put God first in everything they do and to pray every day. I let them know that they can pray in school, but they cannot be disruptive to the learning process and the school environment, and they cannot force their beliefs on others. Students are always praying before tests and many before their meals. This is not the only faith-based group who gave school supplies and provided speakers to encourage, inspire, and reinvigorate our students to do their best every day. I thank all the churches who do this service on a continual basis. You are extraordinary. And it does take a village <coughs> to educate a child. It takes all of us working together. And I ask for continued prayers for our students, administration, faculty, staff, our superintendent as he pursue a new opportunity mm -hmm. as the um, state superintendent of West Virginia. Thank you. I ask them to continue to pray for our interim superintendent, Scott Smith, and everybody up here, all the board members and the student board members as we make good decisions which will impact our students today and tomorrow. Also, I attended six schools on the first day. Uh, Greenview Knowles, Park Hall Elementary, Ridge Elementary, Piney Point, the Forest Center, and the Fair Lead Academy too. Everything was in order and students were happy. Schools were sparkling and meals were served. The buses ran smoothly and on schedule. The teachers were teaching on the first day. Everyone did their part to make a smooth, safe, and happy first day of school for everyone. Thank you, administrators, faculty, staff, and community members for helping us to have a wonderful first day of school. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. Mrs. Allen. Um, I also had the opportunity to participate in the first day of school visits and um, our team was led by Mr. Dale Farrell and um, consisted of myself, uh, Regina Greeley and Delegate Tony O'Donnell. We visited Leonardtown Middle School, Leonardtown High School, Leonardtown Elementary School, Evergreen Elementary School and Town Creek Elementary School. And I, my hat is off to Delegate O'Donnell. Um, he and I had the opportunity to speak at length through the time that we were um, touring the buildings. And um, my point to him, uh, among others, was that one of the many reasons I enjoy going on that first day of school visit is that it gives me an opportunity to see with my own eyes 
um, not just what I've been hearing about, but what's uh, going on in our schools. And, um, and, uh, and you know, um, elected officials uh, often have very busy schedules, and yet uh, Delegate O'Donnell spent the entire morning um, and into the afternoon with us. And I greatly appreciate that he was willing to invest that time into the visit and talking with teachers and principals and students, um, not just about what he does at, um, in the General Assembly, but what they were doing. And so congratulations to all and, um, and my, um, my thanks to um, Mr. Farrell and to Mrs. Greeley and to, to Delegate O'Donnell. It was really a very enjoyable day, and, um, and I know that we have great things ahead of us for the coming school year. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Uh, I attended the uh, St. Mary's College visit with the new president, Dr. Jordan, uh, at the reception that they had for Dr. Jordan down at St. Mary's College, St. Mary's City. She is the seventh president of the college. Mm. It's amazing, mm. yeah. And uh, had an enjoyable conversation with her, and she's looking forward in uh, working with us, working with the school system, and, uh, and she uh, was very, very happy that we have a number one school system Good. in a number one county. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing Mrs. Jordan, having conversations. I'm sure we all are because uh, we were all there uh, and uh, had a good evening. Dr. Moderano, that brings us to you, superintendent's report. Good. Very good. Well, good afternoon, board members. Great to see you and uh, to members of the audience. Uh, glad that you're here. Let me start with some recognition. We have a number of students here, so you can tell the school year started again. Uh, we have a number of students here. We have a number of uh, scouts who are in the audience this evening, board members. You can probably see them peppered throughout. And I want to acknowledge them because I'm, I've been so impressed during my time living and working in St. Mary's County, the number of students who pursue scouting, uh, who pursue Eagle Scout. It seems like we have a very high number of Eagle Scouts per capita uh, in terms of any other region I've ever worked and lived. And I'm very proud of the accomplishments of our young people. So when I call your name, uh, a couple of you were uh, late to come in. I understand this, some individuals presided me with your name. Uh, please stand so we can acknowledge you. We have uh, David Katuglak. Am I saying that right? Okay, very good. I'm sorry I said that wrong. Uh, Troop 561, uh, working on a merit badge. And this is your last one from what I understand for your Eagle Scout, is that correct? Wonderful. Uh, let's give him a round of applause if we would. <laughs> David, tell us what school you go to. I'm homeschooled, but I attend CSM for the dual enrollment. Wonderful. Glad that you're here. Perfect. Okay, very good. We also have Brandon and Colin Mars as well. So if you would stand while I talk about you, Troop 561, uh, also working on uh, merit badges towards your Eagle uh, status as well, correct? And Brandon, if I understand correctly as well, this is your last one, is that correct? Very good. Tell us your schools you go to. I know, but tell everybody else. What grade? Very good. Give them a round of applause if you would. And we have Benjamin Ossenbaugh. Is Benjamin here? Benjamin also is a uh, working towards uh, his merit badge as well. Uh, Troop 420, uh, I might add. And uh, Brandon or Benjamin, excuse me, Benjamin. You are a freshman at Leonardtown High School, is that correct? Very good, and uh, we're very proud of you. Now, I'll put you on the spot since you're the last one standing. Uh, what exactly is a merit badge? Is that just a generic term, or are there specific parts of the merit badge? Would you tell us what that is? A merit badge is a goal that you have to work towards in order to make rank, and rank advancements and to make Eagle. and. Uh, it has different requisites for you to, to complete, and it helps you just learn different skills that will help you later on in life. Okay. Is one of those skills communication? Yes. So you're actually working towards that tonight. <laughs> yes, yeah, I am. So very good. Give him a round of applause if you would. <laughs> very proud of him. So I wanted to start with the recognition of our students. Uh, Sarita, I loved your comments. Uh, great energy in the hallways. Uh, that's always wonderful. There's always great energy in the hallways in our secondary schools. 
and we're pleased about that. And I love the energy that we, when we uh, give those assignments for the summer, oh. I can feel that energy all <laughs> summer. So I, I can feel the energy yeah. and the vibe. You're sending that message to me right now that we must continue that with an increased level of vigor and vim and rigor next summer. Is that correct? Good answer. Thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> Very good. Uh, board members, as you know, another first day of school uh, has come and gone. Uh, August 20th uh, marks an, another wonderful day for us. We were one of the uh, first school systems in the state of Maryland to start. Uh, recognizing we always start on a Wednesday. Uh, I bring that data point out for people that we do our open houses and our orientations on that Monday and Tuesday, work out all of our concerns and uh, issues regarding buses, start on a Wednesday, kind of move people back into the process, get them acclimated both physically and mentally. It takes a toll on everybody. Uh, I do know that. People are not accustomed to waking up at the time at which they need to wake up. And then we have a full week of school now uh, that brings us in quickly then into the Labor Day holiday. Uh, I'm very pleased with how things went in terms of that structure uh, because we've had very few, if any, expressed concerns uh, from our parents this year regarding any issues associated with buses, uh, concerns with scheduling. Uh, we try to mitigate those on that Monday and Tuesday and all through the summer, but with our very organized process in transportation, uh, as I do my inspections and walk through the school system to ensure that everything is operating, uh, we have what is called the foxhole. Uh, which is uh, staffed with all of our staff members uh, for a very long period of time around the clock addressing parent concerns regarding buses. Uh, I actually went over and they were actually laughing and carrying on. I was very disturbed by that. Uh, and they said that they were all caught up in all of their concerns, which is a good thing. Very few expressed concerns, just a lot of clarification questions this year, uh, but we're very pleased with the process and how that has evolved uh, using the technology of which we have as well. We're at about 18,077 students. Now, don't necessarily put that in stone right now because our official data will not be revealed until September 30th when we get all of our full numbers in. Uh, but right now, that number is usually higher. It will level out uh, based upon, then again, the Labor Day holiday. People will come and go after that. Uh, but right now, uh, in the snapshot of time, we're at 18,077 students. As I told you, continue to watch the data. Our predictions are you know, very accurate in terms of our enrollment projections. Uh, if you remember when I became your superintendent in uh, 2005, uh, we were at like 16.5, 16.8, somewhere in there, and we've gone up. I share that information with you uh, tremendously. That's a large number of students to achieve in that period of time. At the same time, uh, the Charles County has remained flat for the most part, a little bit of an increase. Uh, Calvert County has gone down in terms of their numbers overall, in terms of their student enrollment. And we're continuing to be one of the, of the fastest growing school systems in the state of Maryland. So I say that, you know, as I'm giving lots of information out in terms of data, uh, why do we need the new schools? I mean, we're growing very fast. There's a great need to make certain that our, our schools are not overcrowded based upon the statewide capacity, countywide capacity, et cetera. Uh, but we started off on a very good note. Uh, we have a few vacancies that I've shared with you in terms of our teaching uh, staff. Uh, critical need areas, special education in a few, but all of our classrooms are covered right now uh, with the staff members that we have, very highly qualified staff. I don't think Dale is here, uh, but we have the highest level, highest uh, percentage of our highly qualified teachers. We all know that we must have the best teacher in front of our children every day, highly qualified, highly, highly effective, and our school system continues to increase in that level with a high level of fidelity because at the end of the day, that's what truly matters. Uh, we're very pleased with the visits. I'm delighted, board members, that you all acknowledge that. That's something we instituted a few years ago to make sure that all of our schools are canvassed, they receive the visit, uh, you know, that you all go through, ask wonderful questions. You see firsthand, uh, as elected officials, what's occurring in our schools. The level of organization, the level of instruction, the level of enthusiasm that's conveyed. Again, that energy comment, great energy in all the schools that I visited. And I'm constantly, I mean, and several of you referenced it today, I uh, heard bright, shiny faces, instruction occurring. Uh, yes, instruction occurs on day one. It's not like a day where we're just, you know, in there, you know, checking attendance or checking in supplies. We quickly move through that and we're, be we're beginning the instructional process. Every day is valuable, as you know, 180 days. And goodness gracious, let's hope uh, that we don't have a winter like we had uh, last year. But that's a nice transition to my next set of comments. Uh, the predictions are out. Uh, I've heard from a variety of sources, it seems, when those uh, weather almanacs come out and predictions, my phone starts ringing off the hook. I've heard several uh, communications this week that we're going to have a rough winter based upon all kinds of factors. Uh, I've heard, you know, the fish are pulling a certain way, all kinds of wives' tales. 
folk tales, but the, the possibility with the very unusual winter that we, or the unusual summer that we've had, uh, there's been a number of things brewing in both the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Who knows how that will all predict out, uh, you know, La Nina, El Nino, et cetera. But the reality is we had a rough one last year. And I bring to the attention of all of our staff members, all of our community members, that on our website we have a link at the top on our homepage that attaches our weather preparation memo. Uh, it's for our employees. It's for our community. Uh, if you remember, it's not too many years ago, we had events that occurred this time of the year, hurricanes, earthquakes, things can happen. So I alert you that our weather memo, emergency procedures, is up to date. Uh, that will be reviewed. Obviously, it's constantly reviewed with staff. Uh, in the event that we have those kind of events as well. So we're prepared for a very good year. We're primed for a very good year based upon the organization. I praise our teachers, our staff, our community uh, for the support that they provide public education. And again, my final comment, uh, I would be remiss if I did not say the fact is that we, we do have a wonderful community. Ms. Wash, I appreciate you bringing that up in your comments. But we cannot continue to have that conversation and be lulled into sort of a a false sense of everything's okay. You, you had alluded to that. Uh, we have to always keep our guard up regarding safety and security issues of our schools. We have monitoring and checking systems in place in our schools. We have cameras. We have sign-in procedures. But those procedures and software and hardware are only as effective as the human behavior. I always use the example with staff. If somebody then decides to go out of a, out a door and they put a rock in it or a piece of mulch to open, op keep the door open, the entire school population is vulnerable for somebody coming in. So keep our guard up, continue to, quote, to, continue to challenge and uh, question individuals who are in the building who shouldn't be in there, make certain we have our visitors' badges on when we're in there. We must keep our staff safe, we must keep our children safe, we must do everything that we can to never let our guard down. The other piece is that also what Mrs. Washington alluded to, it's important to understand that we are a relatively affluent community and it gives the appearance at times on the surface level that everybody's okay. But I see the data and I look at the community at a much different level. I, I recognize a number of students who have great need in our community and I know many of them firsthand. We have a number of homeless children in our school district. We have a number of children in our free and reduced meals. Our free and reduced meals rate, as you know, during my tenure has gone up 10%. At the same time, our academic indices have gone up as well. But we have students who are in need of assistance uh, from the, the meals at breakfast, et cetera. So we do a great job, but we can't let ourselves think that everything is fine for everybody, because it's not. So as we start this school year, uh, and I begin the process of uh, exiting to my new position, I just want to remind everybody you know, that we need to continue with a, just an increased level of fervor and intensity on taking care of the individuals who are less fortunate. Our school system has been predicated on the understanding that we are only as good as we take care of the least fortunate within our community and within our school system. And this board has a lot to be proud of in that arena, and this community does as well. So programs such as Fairlead, a lot of other programs that we have designed in place, making certain that we're offering breakfast in all of our schools, that we have lunches in our programs, that we have a very clear process for students who qualify, who are economically disadvantaged, that they're not ostracized, that we do everything to make certain that we are a caring and compassionate school system. Because at the end of the day, that's what truly matters, how we treat the less fortunate in our young people. So we can't go continuing to talk about all the wonderful things without reminding people that we still need support and there are students who need assistance out there. And that's what I'm so proud of t during the time that we've worked together by shining the light on the, the data points that the, for the individuals who need more support, the support from this board to provide those uh, differentiated programs and supports and acknowledgments to our young people because, again, I've already stated that's what it's all about. And so I feel really good about where the school system is in that arena and what we continue to do, and I'm very pleased with the supports that our young people are getting because when you walk into a school, as you talked about school supplies and a variety of things, it's very difficult for us to identify who those young people are. I know who they are, and I watch them very clearly when I'm in the schools, but they are not ostracized, and they are not set out to be a part of any different uh, category or looked upon any different. It's not their fault that they're in situations where they have challenges, and we have to do everything that we can to support our young people who need the support. So I wanted to end on this really positive, wonderful 
uh, note by starting off the school year, by ending on the fact that we recognize that our young people need assistance, but we're providing that support, and we can always do more. So uh, as we congratulate our community and our school system, we start the school year off, uh, know that we need to continue to keep our eyes wide open to provide that support for the young people who need it and support all of our young people in terms of all arenas. So thank you very much. Uh, as I give my final report for the, uh, uh, we, not my final report, but my overall report for this evening about the uh, first day of school. And we're going to get into it a little more in detail uh, tonight with some of the actual data points regarding uh, some of the pictures and things that we had. And our website contains some pictures on that as well. So a great opening. Uh, and again, as I think I stated uh, when you and I talked, Gretchen, uh, you know, the, the fact is, is when you start off the school year on a great positive note and you're organized, it sets the tone. And we've set a very good tone. So board members, back to you. Dr. Raspa, thank you again for allowing me to go a little longer with my report this evening. Thank you, Dr. Moderano. <coughs> there are no uh, recognitions this evening. There's no public hearing. There's no public comment. <coughs> Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. I move to approve with the following amendment. 10.04 being moved from the consent to action. Um, Mrs. Crosby, if I may, um, the, the board approved um, its agenda for the evening on um, item number four. Mm -hmm. So in, in order to accomplish that, you would need to table the consent agenda, which would require a motion, and then revisit the board's approval of the agenda and move an amendment to the agenda. Do, do you understand? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. So I, I, if I might, what, what I would suggest in achieving that would be to um, move to table. I move the, to table the con consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion to table the consent agenda, and there's a second. <coughs> Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Something's Anyone opposed? Something's wrong with this. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, something's not quite right. <coughs> what, what are you, board members, what are you trying to achieve? What, may I speak? Go ahead. Thank you. Mrs. Crosby missed the time to amend the agenda when I ask for the approval of the agenda, uh, unfortunately. So now we're down to the consent agenda, and uh, I think there's been some confusion and that, that Mrs. Crosby wants to move one of the consent items over to action items. Right. Yes. So, Ms. Crosby, if I understand you, you wish to amend the consent agenda by moving item 10.04 yes. to an action item, which yes. would be 11.04 yeah. as amended. Yes. Now, as I, as I stated, normally that would be done um, by moving to amend the agenda before the board had approved it when they approved item number four. Because the board has already approved its agenda and is now the question before the board is the consent agenda, the first motion that must be made and approved is to lay the consent agenda upon the table mm -hmm. and revisit the board's approval of the item number four, the agenda for I the meeting. that's right. what we did. We didn't <laughs> yeah. table it, you said. Right. You would need to table the consent agenda yes. and then take up a motion to amend mm -hmm. the agenda for the meeting. And I moved to table it, and Mrs. Washington seconded the motion. And then we were voting okay. yes or no. So, as I understand, Mrs. Cause's motion could stand. There's a second that could stand, right? Okay, the so board members understand. Now, the, the, the motion to table will require a majority vote. Right. And if, as I, let me understand um, if we agree to do this and then we revisit the um, agenda to move that, we can then, uh, um, we can then 
address the consent agenda as amended or yes I mean, my understanding what what would happen here is we would table the consent agenda move to amend the meeting agenda once the meeting agenda has been approved as amended you would then take off the table the consent agenda take it up again and would act on the consent agenda and continue through the rest of the meeting agenda as amended apparently we've never done this before Interesting. my understanding is anyone can move an item what it says. from the consent agenda to action any board member we put them in right consent here. Because it's usually, right. quote, no-brainer things that, you know, we don't want to spend a lot of time about, uh, oh, for example, hiring teachers. Okay, we need teachers. Usually, usually nobody have any problem with that, so that's consent agenda. The administrative and supervisory superintendent, they do right. a re, uh, interviews. He bring forth the most qualified person, and these are just no-brainer type things. So... I've never done it like you're saying. It sounds very complicated. Well, it Ms. has been done. Ms. Wise, may I finish? It's been I'm done sorry. in the past, where if somebody wanted something pulled, it was automatically pulled from consent that's what it to says. action. I, that's I, I, I think the confusion has emerged because the board went ahead and approved without a motion to amend its meeting agenda for tonight. I, I would agree with you that that the item could have easily been moved to an action item, but the time to have done that was when the meeting agenda was approved. I asked in executive session how to go about doing this, sir. Yes, yes ma'am, and, <laughs> and I, I, and I believe that's, I that, that's the advice that I gave you. I took notes. And I was told to approve with the following amendment, move 10.04 from the consent yeah. to the action. So I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I <clears throat> Mrs. Crosby, I, I, I'm not saying you made a mistake on, on moving the item. I'm saying the time to have moved the item was before the board had approved its meeting agenda, which is why I'm saying now in order to revisit that approval, we have to lay upon the table the consent agenda and revisit the board's previous approval of the meeting agenda. And I will be okay. happy to vote yes okay. to carry this out. All right, call for the question. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, questions for call. We have a motion on the floor. It's been second. <clears throat> Everyone in favor. Questions from the press. Everyone in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Okay, and the ayes have it. Okay. Uh, Wait a minute. Uh, what did you say? No. You mean no? You don't want. I calls? want to talk about this tonight. I, I think that's what we're we're trying, to that's what we oh, okay. that's what trying to get okay, to. Oh, okay. That's what we're trying to get to. Okay, then I. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> How many of us have done this before? I ask you that. <clears throat> okay. Now Look, we need uh, now a motion. To now, Mrs. Crosby, you yes. would need to make a motion. Yes. To amend the meeting agenda. All right. By moving Ten. consent item. 10.04 from the consent, consent agenda to action. to action items listed as item number 11.04. Okay. I move to amend the, I hope I do this right, the consent agenda to move item number 10.04 to action items 11. Point, what was that? It would be 04. 04. There you go. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Good. Okay. Thank the ayes have it. So. Now, now we need a motion we, to approve the consent agenda. Yeah. Okay. Just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Okay. Does everybody understand now yes. that on the consent agenda item, 10.04 personnel hiring of independent counsel has been moved to action item 11.04. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Crosby, is yes. that correct? Yes, that sounds good to me. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Crosby. Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? 
I move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. I second it. Okay, everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. <laughs> Almost need a break. <laughs> Maybe we all learned a little okay. legal stuff. Okay, moving on. Uh, action item, the first action item is policy EED, second reading, Mr. Thompson. Good evening. Good evening. So this is the second reading of policy EED. Uh, this policy has been vetted by staff and gone through also by the board's attorney, Mr. O'Mealy. And it also has been reviewed by our drug testing or controlled substance and alcohol testing company as well. It went through the first reading uh, with a few comments, but there was no changes at, after the first reading and there was no comments at the public hearing. So this, this is the policy EED, school bus driver controlled substance and alcohol testing program. And this policy was adjusted to meet the outline that we're doing all policies under now. And we made some adjustments moving some of the items that were in there because they were more regulation items and to give the general policy of the, the board and um, their perspective on it. So this is how it reads now. The purpose of this policy is to establish a controlled substance and alcohol testing program for St. Mary's County Public Schools, bus driver trainees, and certified school bus drivers as required by federal and state laws and regulations for all commercial drivers license holders. The Board of Ed Policy Statement, the Board of Education of St. Mary's County believes the school bus driver trainees and certified school bus drivers have one of the greatest responsibilities in the school system, the safe transportation of students. Therefore, the Board is committed to maintaining exemplary school bus driver standards which require school bus driver trainees and certified school bus drivers to participate in a controlled substance and alcohol testing program. The Board prohibits all school bus driver trainees and certified school bus drivers from the use, possession, purchase, sale, distribution, or being under the influence of or impaired by controlled substances or alcohol on school property or while operating a school vehicle. All school bus driver trainees and certified school bus drivers are prohibited from using any illegal controlled substance at any time. The board authorizes the superintendent of schools to develop a controlled substance and alcohol testing program that adopts the requirements of the Omnibus Transportation Employee Testing Act of 1991. The controlled substance and alcohol test program shall meet or exceed the substantive and procedural requirements of standards under the regulatory auspices of the United States Department of Transportation, 49 CFR Part 40, specifically the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, 49 CFR Part 382. And the program shall also meet or exceed the requirements of the Code of Maryland Regulations 13A 0607. And then there's one other item basically that we had in here that was left from previous. And then the other items were readjusted into the regulation. So at this time, I ask for your approval of the adjustments to policy EED. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Board members, questions or comments? Mrs. Allen? No questions. Thank you very much. It's quite self-explanatory. Mrs. Washington? Great job. Thank you. Mr. Matthews? Thank you, sir. Mrs. Crosby? Very good. Thank you. Sarita? Sir. I have no questions. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Thompson, I'm sure that uh, Mr. O'Mealy has had input and has read the proposals. Is yes, he's gone through it thoroughly. Okay, thank you. Okay, board members, do we have a motion? I move that the Board of Education approve policy EED, school bus driver drug and alcohol testing program, as presented. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much, thank you. Mr. Thompson. <clears throat> Next action item, Section J, Policy, Second Reading, Dr. Ridgell. Good evening. Good evening. This is the second reading for J Policies. In July 2012, recall the Maryland State Board of Education issued a report focused on reform of school discipline in Maryland. The report titled School Discipline and Academic Success, Related Parts of Maryland's Education Reform was the result of almost two years of study by the Maryland State Board of Education. 
In the two years since the report, the State Board sought input resulting in changes to the regulations on student discipline. These changes were approved in January 2014 by the State Board. As a result of their actions, the changes being considered today are actually already part of the Code of Maryland regulations known as COMO. <coughs> These changes will update our local policies to reflect the changes already passed by the State Board. The definitions reflected in the proposed changes are taken from COMAR. All of these policies were reviewed by Mr. O'Mealy, as well as the directors in the Division of Instruction, the Assistant Superintendent, and the Superintendent's Cabinet. And a special thanks to Faith Abernathy for all of her hard work to revise the policies to be consistent with COMAR. The first reading was held at the work session on July 15th. The public hearing for these policies were held at your August the 13th meeting and there were no speakers. The policies were posted on your website and there were no inquiries until today. The comments provided today are more reflective of the work of the J section advisory committee and are not really within the scope of the current proposed changes taken from COMAR. The changes today do not <coughs> reflect anything more than the changes in COMAR. So I request your approval at tonight's meeting. It is best really to start with JGBA. because this defines the changes in the terms in respect to suspensions. So if you see, we just made the, the recommendation to switch the order of A and B, nothing in terms of contact. Um, the real changes from COMAR begins in C. Short-term suspensions are now between one and three days, still determined by the principal Students receive their assignments and all make up work for full credit and the absences are coded as lawful. Long-term suspensions are the four to 10 days, again handled at the school level. Students are permitted to receive assignments and make up work for full credit. Absences are coded as lawful. Principals are still able to hold pre-expulsion conferences as appropriate. Extended suspensions upon the recommendation of the principal in those instances when the student poses an eminent threat of serious harm to other students or staff, or the student has engaged in chronic and extreme disruption of the educational process that has created a substantial barrier to learning for other students, the student may be suspended. This excludes the 45 days of unilateral removal of students with disabilities. The suspension for extended can be 11 to 45 days. These are still determined by the superintendent or designee in accordance with the procedures set forth in Maryland law and students are to be provided educational services. The other new definition is expulsion in those instances where the student poses an eminent threat of serious harm to other students or staff, the student may be expelled for 45 days or longer as determined by the superintendent or designee in accordance with the procedure set forth in Maryland law. The duration of the expulsion is outlined at the expulsion conference. Students are to be provided educational services and behavioral supports. So in changing those, it became necessary then to change the actual definitions within the policy as you see before you. JGB, then student suspensions and expulsions, takes those same definitions and updates in this policy since they're also include it. JGC was alternatives to expulsion 
Now it becomes alternatives to extended suspensions and expulsions. Again, the same <laughs> definitions. JGD, the student readmission after an expulsion now becomes student's readmission after a long-term suspension, extended suspension, or expulsion. And again, takes the same definitions and includes them in this policy as well. The other one is JFB, students due process rights. The change here is that, or the appeals for short-term and long-term suspensions still come to me. The appeals for the extended suspensions and expulsions come directly to you as the Board of Education. Any questions? Any questions or comments of Dr. Ridgell? Uh, Sarita? I do not have any questions, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Crosby? No, thank you. Mr. Matthews. Very thorough job, sir. Thank you. Ms. Washington. Thank you for what you've done. Um, the Board of Education members received an email from Liz Leskinen uh, with some concerns about this policy, and I know you got a copy of it, too. It was sort of late, about 11.30 this morning. Can you address some of the concerns that she raises in her email to the Board? The concerns that is raised in that email are actually things, as I said, that would be a more appropriate handled by the J Section Advisory Committee. Many of them are referencing like clarifications. Remember, they're in regulations. They're not in policy. So the policies you have are the definitions taken from COMAR not things that would be covered in the regulation or things that would again be in the procedures that are used by the school system. They're handled by the J Section Advisory Committee. Okay, of which they are a part of that committee? They are a part of that committee. And that committee meets how often? The committee meets every year when we have changes to consider from the Maryland State Department of Education. So they will have an opportunity to meet with that committee to express their concerns regarding this new policy, which we have to follow, which was new in COMAR. Correct, because COMAR that was passed in January of 2014 says then we need to review all of the code of conduct in this current school year and go through each of the codes of conduct and see how it applies here in St. Mary's and be sure it is aligned with the code of conduct that the State Board passed this summer. Okay, so when will the committee meet to, and then um, the associations can discuss their concerns, which will relate to regulation, not to policy. Because our policy deal with the law and the regulation deals with the how-to of the policy. Correct. Um, I'm hoping October, and I'm saying I'm, I'm hoping because the first meeting for the directors of student services is early October. So we have to go to Baltimore, meet with the, the staff there from the Maryland State Department of Education, as to what the plans are and what the state boards has changed in Comar and what we need to look at. Thank you, Dr. Ridgell. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. <clears throat> Mrs. Allen. I think from reading through this, uh, you have carried out what Comar says quite well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Maryland Association of Boards of Education all along um, has expressed their concern uh, to the State Board in appropriate ways with respect to the uh, decisions made by the State Board, the recommendations, the COMAR, um, and, uh, and MABE continues to try to 
um, have reasoned conversation with state board members with respect to some of the changes that have been made and some of the um, perhaps unintended consequences that may result uh, from these changes. So um, <laughs> I appreciate that you have uh, made certain that our policies are in compliance with what uh, the State Board has put forth and um, uh, I'm sure that you will be updating us as that, as that goes along. I know that their timeline in terms of uh, COMAR, but also the uh, Code of Conduct um, uh, dragged out much more than any of us thought that it would, and that has presented some great challenges. But um, thank you for putting this forward, and, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Dr. Monroe, any last thoughts on it? Well, th there are some last thoughts, and I think I always try to go to the higher level with things and frame it. This is um, work that has uh, commenced and has been carried out over the last two years. Uh, it has been a very arduous, uh, long and involved vetting process. Uh, a lot of research has been conducted uh, on it. Uh, a number of other uh, groups have been involved with it. I've been involved in a number of different work groups pertaining to it, uh, pipeline to prison, a variety of other conversations uh, that we've had uh, with uh, Liz Kameen as the chairperson of that particular group. Um, but the, keep in mind the, the rationale behind all of this is that striking the right balance uh, for understanding the need to hold students accountable when uh, violations occur in the school based upon the code of conduct, et cetera. And then the balance of making certain that children, young people are still entitled to an education that moves them forward. Because there's lots of information, the research, the data, that when we suspend young people, they fall further behind. Uh, it interferes with the learning process. So the balance between uh, the accountability process providing alternatives and options for young people uh, to continue with their work uh, during that period of time, and then to continue to keep an eye on them uh, for uh, abilities to, to rehabilitate, uh, to use it as a corrective action, not necessarily punitive, and uh, to advance it as we monitor the young people who get involved in violations. Uh, there, there was a theory of thought that uh, prior ways it was set up in terms of expulsions, a variety of other things that they were detrimental to the student, uh, zero tolerance, all those kind of conversations. I can tie in some of the examples uh, that were really bell ringer events in Virginia uh, that brought this to the forefront, lots of coverage in the Washington Post. Uh, our state board engaged in lots of conversation about this over the last several years, which has brought it to this point. Uh, the, the superintendents and as uh, the past president of the superintendent group uh, we've been very involved in providing testimony in uh, cooperation and collaboration with MABE, wanting to do the right thing, but also acknowledging the role of the teacher, uh, the role of the principal, the role of the administrator in providing a safe and orderly env uh, environment. So the operative word is balance. Uh, the aspect is understanding the culture and the attitude of which we're coming from this at. And I'm very uh, pleased with the work that has occurred uh, in terms of our policy, how it's worded, that honors the, the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, in terms of what needs to occur for the COMAR adjustments, the regulations and carrying out. We've provided great training uh, to our administrators, uh, to our staff. We're providing communications to our parent community regarding this. So that's the key in terms of our robust communication plan about all of this. But understand what the genesis of what, how this all came about and the philosophical understandings that are the under, underpinning of everything. And again, it's about that balance. And I feel very comfortable with this uh, after it has been uh, extremely uh, and are, I guess, consistently vetted throughout the last several years by a lot of different stakeholders. And so I'm pleased there's been a number of eyes on it. This is just not something we're just checking a box today and approving for the sake of an arbitrary approval. There's been lots of feedback on this to bring us to this point. You've all been privy to that. I suspect there'll be more training for me, you know, regarding this, more conversations at that level. And it's something to keep an eye on. There'll be uh, lots of data collected on this to see how it's going uh, with the understanding that the board would, uh, the state board would do any forms of tweaking as needed uh, in the future once they receive that feedback. So I just wanted to, as you vote on this, and as you have the further discussion about this, uh, why we're doing what we're doing, and I want the community to understand that uh, overall. But again, I'm going to go back to the fact that we've done lots of communications on this, both internally and externally, and the reasons why we're doing this. Okay, that's what I wanted to mention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Do we have a motion? I move. Please go. Oh, thank you. I move that the Board of Education approve the Section J policies as presented. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the ayes have it. Dr. Richter, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Richter. You've done a great job with yes. this. I really want to commend you on this. It's a lot of work. Thank you. Next action item is the final FY 2014 budget and category requests. Ms. Tammy McCourt. Good evening. We're currently closing the books on what has been without a doubt an extremely challenging fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Upon my arrival about seven months ago to St. Mary's County Public Schools, as you're aware, I performed an extensive analysis of our financials and this led to an extremely intense and professionally challenging time. Through my analysis, it was discovered that our health care costs would be greatly exceeded the amount budgeted. The superintendent took immediate action in early March, implementing cost savings measures in an attempt to cover the school system's expenses. Those measures included a freeze of all hiring, evaluating all temporary positions, eliminating all non-essential positions, cabinet level review of all requisitions, approval of only emergency purchases, eliminating conference attendance, minimizing all overtime, and use of board vehicles for travel, minimizing travel reimbursements. On April 9th, a fiscal 2014 fiscal issues presentation was provided to the board with a special board meeting called on April 23rd to discuss immediate actions taken to address a healthcare budget shortfall and three proposed options. We immediately brought to the attention of the Board of County Commissioners on April 28th to discuss our budgetary circumstance. On May 14th, we provided another extensive presentation and had lengthy discussion on the board budget adjustments previously discussed on the three different options and received your approval to submit it to the Board of County Commissioners for their consideration. This included our best case scenario at that time with an anticipated county appropriation need of 782,000. At that meeting in May, on May 14th, based on the information that we had in hand, a health care shortfall was projected at $6 million. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we anticipated an additional shortfall in the area of special education therapists, snow removal, and utilities in an amount of $1,055,000. Due to the immediate position and budget freeze that was put in place, anticipated savings were projected to be $2.8 million. And by budget, budget freeze, I mean that we pay the teachers, we kept the lights on in the classroom, and the buses on the road. That's all. We expected miscellaneous revenues to come in higher than budgeted by $436,000, leaving a net budgetary deficit of $3,782,000. Mindful that this was a projection as of this date, taking into consideration historical trend analysis. So the question becomes, where are we now? Our auditors have completed their field work with no findings or concerns noted at this time which would indicate a need to change the numbers. The final audited financial statements for 2014 are due by September 30th, and they're currently being compiled. Therefore, what I present to you at this time are the preliminary actuals as of today, but no changes are anticipated per our discussions with the auditors. The health care shortfall came in at $5.6 million, which includes a required adjustment to the outstanding claims liability. Special education therapists, snow removal, and utilities came in at $960,000 shortfall. Budgetary savings were recognized in the amount of $2.7 million, but not without pain. Instructional materials were not purchased. Planned end of school year and beginning of summer maintenance projects were not performed. And due to the hiring freeze, many people ended up performing multiple jobs. Once again, it was not with pain. Other miscellaneous revenues came in unexpectedly at $1 million, 
and excessive budget. And this was predominantly due to the $594,000 return of health care hospital escrow. And that was due to us changing the plan back to the modified retrospective plan. This left us with a net budgetary deficit of $2.7 million. So I'm sure the next question that you have is where or were we able to cover this? And the answer was absolutely yes. Completely within St. Mary's County Public Schools. And the next question is, well, how did we do it? With that, I actually need to take you back to June 30th of 2013 and what our fund balance was at that time. At that date, we had a total fund balance of $6.1 million. Fund balance is broken down into four components, non-spendable, which included prepaid items totaling $10,520, committed, which included an amount set aside for an insurance call of $1 million, assigned, which included a planned fund balance usage per the adopted FY 2014 budget of $2.5 million, encumbrance obligations at year end, as of 2013 year end, of $623,000, and the unassigned fund balance of $2 million. Of these areas, the committed and the unassigned amounts are what are available to be used to cover the budgetary shortfall. The committed for the insurance call and the unassigned equal to the $3 million that we've discussed many times at the previous board meetings. Those are the amounts that are available to, shop, to cover the net budgetary deficit. Every year there are adjustments or changes to the fund balance as we balance the books and reconcile the records for the year end. This year it included the cancellation of prior year encumbrances of $204,000 and a reduction of prepaids of $1,900, which increases our available fund balance to $3.2 million. Subtract from that the net budgetary deficit of $2.7 million and our remaining unassigned fund balance is $480,000 to the good. So to recap, the June 30th, 2013 fund balance was $6.1 million and the preliminary June 30, 2014 fund balance is $663,000. The preliminary fund balance for June 30th, 2014 includes non-spendable prepays amount of $8,620, no money set aside for an insurance call within fund balance, no obligation of fund balance for fiscal 2015, an encumbrance obligation of $173,000, and an unassigned fund balance of $480,000. So we're now at one of the final steps to close out fiscal 2014, and that is the budget adjustment. The Board of County Commissioners had requested that we come back to them once the fiscal year had closed following the audit field work being performed and the actual numbers being known. I present to you for your approval the necessary budget adjustment. It is balanced, reflecting a requested increase of $3,864,000, rounded to the nearest thousand. I won't speak to each individual line, but I'll highlight a few of the lines of greatest importance. On the revenue side, the budget adjustment includes a plan use of fund balance I'm sorry, a plan use of the health care reserve, an increase in the amount of $1 million, a plan use of the unassigned fund balance, or an increase to the budget of $1.7 million, and an increase of the hospital escrow re refund of $594,000, and then miscellaneous other revenues. On the expenditure side, there are many categorical transfers, utilizing budgetary savings from some categories to cover overages and others, but in particular, the category of fixed charges with an increase of $5.2 million. So in closing, I'd like to just take a moment to reiterate that a significant amount of work and dedication by the superintendent and his cabinet, every administrator, teacher, and support employee was what allowed us to close this budget gap and address this fiscal situation. We recognized a problem, we communicated a problem, we put in place a plan to solve the problem, and we effectively addressed this problem with $480,000 remaining an unassigned fund balance and a fully balanced fiscal 2015 budget. 
At this time, your approval of the budget adjustment as presented is requested and directing the superintendent to forward this budget adjustment to the Board of County Commissioners for their approval as required under Comar. Okay, board members. May I? You want, yes. Thank right. you to continue the presentation. Thank you, Ms. McCourt, uh, for your very detailed and very clear understanding of the overall closeout. So board members, again, I want to frame this. Uh, we all recognize uh, what has occurred, what occurred in the spring, and the conversations that occurred around all this discussion amidst all the noise, uh, as Ms. McCourt stated, uh, that the problem was recognized, the problem, we put a plan in place to address the problem, and we moved forward. As we stated, uh, that as we met with the county commissioners to balance and approve our budget for 15, which we fully have in place, a fully balanced budget that is in operation right now, uh, the recommendation was that we continue to close out 14 to determine what we can do to solve that on our own. If you remember at that time, uh, I stated publicly as I went to the uh, microphone at the Board of County Commissioners meeting that I'm making it a personal and professional mission to solve this on our own, to solve it on our own. There was great conversation about the need for more money, but in a very responsible and judicious manner, uh, we put people on alert in the sense of what we needed to do. Uh, in that sense. So as we continue to meet weekly, daily, getting updates on you know, where we were monitoring our dollars uh, down to the wire uh, as we closed out the books, uh, Ms. McCourt were constantly, Ms. McCourt and I are constantly in communication exactly where we were. So the bottom line is, is that we have been able to solve this problem, one, on our own, after the identification of the problem, tightening up the budget that we existed, having a fully balanced budget in terms of 15, not only have we solved it on our own through the additional adjustments that we have been able to now have p p to replenish approximately 480000 back in to the fund balance. So although the conversations were great, uh, in many ways distracting, you know, throughout the process, we stayed focused in terms of what needed to be done through that development of that process. So 14 uh, closes out. Uh, with the understanding that we are following this with a very clearly methodical process defined by county government of how we will bring this forward. We have been able to solve this on our own uh, as a school system, many people involved in that process with $480,000 to the good and the fund balance that we will take over to the Board of County Commissioners without having to ask for any additional funding from the county to support this effort. Let me repeat that again, that there will be no request for any additional funding from the county commissioners for support to balance out FY14. One more time, please. So, for that sake. So, again, I want to emphasize it to, to, to make certain we all understand where we are and that we are currently in fiscal year 15. 15 is running and operating with a level of full fidelity. We recognize the issue with raises for our employees. We recognize the tight economic times, but we also acknowledge as I exit uh, my tenure as superintendent, we also acknowledge the extreme challenges of which we have had over the 10 years of running this school system. And regardless of whether people want to acknowledge it or not, there has to be conversation about funding levels, about funding conversations, about the overall where we stand as a school system regarding that in terms of per pupil expenditure being 24 out of 24 overall, that is a fact. No matter how you have that conversation, you delineate it in terms of your three lanes of funding, federal, state, and local, and you put, pull all those together, it is 24 out of 24. And those conversations have to occur. They have to continue to occur. So we've made the adjustments necessary. We close out 14 in a very, very respectful, responsible way with the $480,000 to the good to the fund balance. And again, we are fully operating with full fidelity in this school year at the level which we are operating. So, Ms. McCord, I applaud your efforts uh, in terms of the acknowledgement of the audits that have occurred, the conversations that have occurred with our financial uh, experts regarding this, your expertise in this arena as a CPA, uh, the full acknowledgement of the work that needs to be done and has been done, and I commend you for that. I would like to publicly commend you and give you a round of applause for your work that you've done for us. It is a tremendous amount of work.
amidst all the concerns that, that occurred and all the noise uh, that was made during that period of time, and we recognize that. We've taken the responsibility that needs to be done for that, and now we move forward in that sense uh, in terms of the continued acknowledgement of solid audits for the period of time in which I've worked here, continue to have those as we move the school system forward. So Dr. Raspa, Board of Education members, you know how we have been working tirelessly uh, on this process uh, for the last, uh, seems like an eternity in terms of months yeah. uh, regarding this. And so today I bring this forward to you to close this out with the acknowledgement of what needs to be done to take it across to the county uh, to finalize that process and finally put 14 to bed. Dr. Raspa. Dr. Marano, thank you for a great summation. Mrs. McCourt, thank you very, very much. Please thank the staff. I see some of the staffs here tonight. Uh, the board wants to thank everyone who's worked over the weeks and weeks uh, working through this problem and to get the books balanced. And we're to the good of $480,000 uh, fund balance. Excellent, excellent. Mrs. Allen. Um, I, you know, Mrs. McCourt, I, um, it's it's actually a, a great testament to you that you didn't turn and run back across the bridge um, because uh, this is not anything we have ever um, faced before uh, and for you to come in and um, delve into the budget in the way that you did and to um, not only identify the problems but also to um, call attention to them to make certain that uh, the superintendent could make the um, needed immediate uh, changes uh, in order to address the shortfall. Um, and, and you talked about addressing the problem. The, the piece that you, I think, left out was that not only was the problem um, identified and, and dealt with, but uh, for the, in the short term, but also in the long term to put safeguards in Absolutely. place to ensure that um, this is not something that ever happens again. Um, and for me, that is of, of great importance. Um, two things to ask about, um, and I, I know that we've talked about this before. Uh, I had indicated great concern over the fact that we um, have have uh, purposely had a million dollars in the budget to uh, address any shortfalls, healthcare shortfalls, because the uh, way we had been uh, addressing our healthcare costs and have now returned to uh, many years resulted in receiving a large health insurance refund. Um, and then putting that million dollars aside to make sure that uh, in the event that there was a call saying that we had not paid in sufficient premiums that we would have the monies uh, in order to do so within the budget. Um, you spoke to us uh, in the past about one of the safeguards being um, rebuilding that fund of $1 million. Would you speak to how that will be accomplished and over what period of time? Certainly. It's highly recommended that we have two years worth of 5% uh, call money set aside because we are on the retrospective plan. So uh, at any point in time, uh, we could owe Care First money back based on what our experience was. Um, we're currently um, have $625,000 set aside in the FY 2015 budget towards rebuilding that uh, health care reserve. Thank you. Um, and you also mentioned in terms of um, what, our, what comprised our fund balance that we had some prior year encumbrances. And um, you indicated that a portion of those prior year encumbrances were canceled, <coughs> yielding a uh, little more than $204,000. Can you speak to what encumbrances were able to be canceled or what determination was made in terms of what encumbrances? At the end of every fiscal year, um, it's a good practice to go back and review any outstanding encumbrances to, to ensure whether or not there's still an obligation out there in this particular case. I apologize, I don't have the specific details with me for those $204,000, but that's essentially what's happened. 
Um, we did an, a very tight um, and thorough review of all encumbrances to determine what could be canceled. And it's recommended practice that we minimize the number of encumbrances to carry forward to the future fiscal years. And um, our auditors like to see that number as low as possible. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Mrs. Washington. Thank you, Mrs. McCord. I appreciate all your hard work and efforts coming to a new job and you were faced with an immediate challenge. I want to thank you, your staff and administrators for working closely together to make the necessary changes and painful cuts so that we can go back to the Board of County Commissioners to let them know we have successfully closed out 2014. We're looking forward to 2015 and we will have safeguards in place to ensure that this doesn't happen again. So we're looking at the books, we're looking at the income, we're looking at the expenses, and we're closely monitoring it. And, and when you go over, I hope you will let them know what our plan is, that it is not, that our goal is not to let this happen again. So thank you very much for all your hard work and efforts. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. Mr. Mrs. McCourt, thank you again for not running from us. <laughs> I also want to thank you. Uh, you know, timing's everything in, in this world and this life and everything. And if you hadn't have discovered this budget shortfall as soon as you did, we would have never been able to fix it ourselves. So thank you for being on top of everything. Thank you for jumping in with both feet, grabbing the bull by the horns, and wrestling it down. And please understand, I could not have done it successfully without the support of the uh, superintendent's cabinet and the finance staff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every, mm -hmm. it, uh, it was a full-blown effort, but I just glad you're still here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Matthews. And that goes for you too, Mr. Springer. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Crosby. I still need. To, I told you at the graduation I wanted a course in one on one. Remember, <laughs> you are welcome to come up and visit me at any time. And I possible. will, and because um, I keep, I'm still totally disorganized, and I keep finding papers with the health care in this month and the health care in that month, and all the. My husband's much better with the health care than I am. But thank you for your hard work, and it is nice to have you in St. Mary's County. Thank you. Serena, I do not have any questions. Uh, thank you. Okay. Dr. Monroe, you have to give you the last word, if I'm there is it. enough. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, board members, we need a motion. I move we approve the presented budget adjustment, which includes an increase in the FY 2014 budget and categorical transfers. Additionally, I move that we approve submittal of this budget adjustment to the Board of County Commissioners for their approval as required by the Annotated Code of Maryland. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mrs. McCourt. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Wonderful job. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to the next action item. Uh, personnel hiring of independent counsel. <clears throat> uh, there has been a breach of confidential personnel information. The board has a responsibility to its employees. There was discussion that an investigation to the alleged unlawful disclosure of personnel records and information should be conducted by the Board of Education. The investigation should be conducted by independent counsel not affiliated with the school system. The board members, including the superintendent, have indicated that they have no knowledge how the confidential personnel information was leaked out to the press. Legal counsel has recommended to the board that an investigation should be held and to hire independent counsel to conduct the investigation. On August the 20th, 2014, the board agreed to investigate whether there was an <coughs> unlawful disclosure to the press of confidential personnel information about a St. Mary's County Public School employee 
and hire an independent counsel to conduct the investigation and to make a report to the Board of Education. Mrs. Crosby, we'll begin with you. Yes, um, I just want um, the public to know that every one of us are going to be inv investigated, which is good, and that uh, the independent counsel will cost $300 an hour. Um, no one has been able to tell me the upper limit of how much we will pay. Does anybody know what the upper limit is? As much as it takes, I guess. As much as it takes? Is that how much we'll pay? Uh, my only other question would be to take a good look at BIE section of our, um, uh, uh, I want to say board, yeah, board docs. Uh, there's a provision in there for board members being protected if they're acting in good faith. Um, now, my next question would be, and I wouldn't, I'm not talking about anybody in particular would be, this person has to be independent. There's been an awful lot of independent that isn't independent. Um, I'm not having my uncle do it. I'm not having my aunt do it. But we need to make daggone sure that this is an independent council. Something else I'd like the public to know. We are not chosen by the Board of Education. And Roy Dyson made this very clear to me. We are chosen by the electors. We are chosen by the voting public. I think that's very, very important to know. And we can't just throw people here and throw people there because maybe we don't like them. Or maybe we don't like something that's happened and it didn't turn out the way we might have wanted it to turn out. So we need to find a really independent counsel in this. And I'm all for an investigation to find out. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Mr. Matthews. It's plain and simple. It's the right thing to do to investigate. Thank you very much. Mrs. Washington. Uh, the board agree that we would hire an independent firm to investigate um, allegations that were made about a breach of confidentiality and mm -hmm. the release yeah. of personnel information. That is the right thing to do. And that's, that's it. And uh, I await the investigation and the outcome of the investigation. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. Mrs. Allen. No, did you take the responsibility we're sworn to to uphold the law very seriously. And um, as has been stated here, uh, this is the right thing to do. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. This is an action item. We need a motion. Um, I actually came prepared. I move that the Board of Education investigate whether there was an unlawful disclosure of confidential personnel information of a St. Mary's County Public School employee and hire an independent counsel to conduct the investigation and make a report to the Board of Education. Right. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Every one in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Board members, thank you very much. And at this time, we'll take a break.
The board will reconvene at this time. Moving <laughs> along into <coughs> information items. Mm. Yeah, Chesapeake Public Charter I'm School Renewal. Mrs. Hall and Mrs. Foyne. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Mrs. Funya and I would like to present to you an update of the status of the Chesapeake Public Charter School and also provide you with a contract for your review and consideration and hopeful approval at the um, September 10th board meeting. Before we go any further, I would like to um, introduce some special guests that are part of the Chesapeake Public Charter School Alliance and some other folks that are help have helped us through this process. And let me begin with the um, Charter School Alliance Chairperson, Robin Bainey, the Treasurer, Anne Marie Daly, Board Member Tara Duarte, Board Member Julia Nichols, Staff Members Karen Ann Bailey, uh, Susan Rye, Language Arts, Sandy Embriali, Karen Antonacio Oliver, Jessica Blankenship, the Counselor. Um, I'd also like to um, introduce to you and thank him very much for being here, um, Mr. Robert Askey from Askey and Askey and Associates, who um, is the accountant on the CPA firm of record for the Alliance. He's here with us tonight. Thank you. Um, our grant, our accountant that handles Fund 14, which is the Charter School Fund, that's Mr. Rob Springer. So I would like to thank him and everyone for being here this evening. As you know, to evaluate um, a, pub, a public charter school, there are really six areas that need to be considered. Academic achievement, the human resources and staffing component, the status of facilities, finance, the governance structure, and contractual compliance. So we're going to begin with Mrs. Fania giving you an update on the current state of the charter school. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, okay, so these are our demographics for last year. We did start. We have um, been in school for, what, two and a half weeks now, so we're rolling. You guys will get there. It's all good. Um, we have 360 students this year, grades K to 8. Um, we're still kind of in that average range of the percentage of students who carry an IEP. 5% um, of our students carry 504s. We're kind of lower on the free and reduced meal end from last year, but that varies from year to year, as you know. Um, and our demographics reflect those of St. Mary's County Public Schools. Um, just to refresh you on our admissions procedures, uh, we accept applications in the month of January. That's our open application period. Um, we have two parent information sessions that are always very well attended and that's when um, people get to have a tour of the school by staff and students. Um, once we get all of those applications in, and this year we had 287, um, we do a family code and then each family is ranked um, in a blind lottery that's pulled by Judge Densford this year since we lost Judge Briscoe. Um, this year we had 17 spaces in kindergarten because the other 19 spaces were siblings of students that were already enrolled in the school and as you know we have a sibling policy. Um, so this year uh, we are at 278 students on the wait list um, and that is because even after we do the lottery applications still come in. So that's even after having pulled the, pulled the students in. Um, we do renew that wait list yearly so once we hit January and finish that application process, then we dump the previous year's wait list, so you have to reapply year after year. Um, we were talking a little bit about adjusting the timeline for the lottery, maybe pulling it back um, into the no November, December timeframe um, because for a couple of reasons. We want to look at what our PPA is going to be for the upcoming year and, and having an idea of what kids are coming into kindergarten will help that process. Um, and also, we want to look at getting the information to parents a little bit sooner than we have been because a lot of times if they don't get into our school and they want to choose a private school, they have to make an obligation prior to when they hear about whether they've gotten in with us. Um, so that's our process. 
Um, all of our staff are highly qualified. We have a very similar rundown to what we had last year. There's 40 of us. Um, myself, <coughs> Ms. Antanasio, we still have just the two kindergartens with the two kindergarten paras. Uh, 19 total classroom teachers, 20 specialists and support staff, um, a counselor, our nurse, and um, with going to 360, we, we have, it varies, but a 21 to 1 ratio this year, um, which is really, some are 18 or 19, so yeah, some of our middle school classes are even smaller than that, so we're still averaging there. Okay, just a reminder of some things that set us apart and make us different. Um, we are a non-graded system. We do a narrative-based report card based on the Common Core standards. Um, our eighth graders do receive letter grades, and that is to help them be able to transition into ninth grade. And by the way, our first graduating cl class of eighth graders this year are seniors in high school. Wow. So they'll become part of your data next year for the graduation rate, so, yes. just so you know. Um, we also have our portfolio system, and we still continue to do electives where the students are um, in multi-age groupings throughout the day. We still have our arts and environmental focus, and <clears throat> we do have several languages this year, actually. We have Spanish, French, and our friend Rosetta Stone is teaching Italian, so we are very excited <laughs> about her. Okay, um, arts integration, as I mentioned. This week actually starts our, our first artist in residence, so we're very excited um, to have somebody working with our middle school kids to do batiking. Um, we are still very focused on the whole child. We still continue to have our garden and our salad bar and are constantly working with our kids to keep themselves healthy and safe. Yes, ma'am. I saw something. Did you have chickens? We have yeah. chickens. Surprise. Tell me about the chickens, and I, I was looking at some photographs, and I was impressed. I, I saw the guard, and I said, they have two chickens. We do. I mean, I mean. Well, you know how every year people think it's fun to get their kids little chicks for Easter, and then they don't know what to do with them when they grow up to become chickens? Um, I think, Anne-Marie, that might be how we got our chickens. <laughs> She planned it, um, but but we the kids love to to take care of the chickens and they are actually a part of our composting system because they eat our slop um, and they give us eggs and so our fourth graders sell the eggs um, so it's just a nice thing to have. We actually used to have four. We had a couple past, but I imagine that there'll be some more in our future. So we love having them there. They're really a lot of fun to have Thank around. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and I swear, a lot of our staff brings in stuff from home and feeds the chickens. You know what I mean? Like dinner scraps from the night before. So very well fed. Um, we still have our uniform policy. So our kids are in uniforms, um, except for Fridays. And we still, despite, you know, tough financial times, are getting our kids out there into the field. Um, that still remains a priority for us. Um, so nothing speaks like photos. So these are just some updated photos of our students um, doing the robotics thing with Miss Teeple and some team building activities. Uh, a couple examples of our arts integration. <coughs> One of our electives was that, that students made the signs. And if you come to the school, you'll see them. I don't know if you remember MASH, but it looks like MASH mm -hmm. because there's signs, you know, road signs pointing everywhere. Um, they, the students painted a great mural on our wall of the Chesapeake Bay, um, which has the little <coughs> um, sensors. So if you put the smart pen up to it, it'll tell you about each portion of, of that area. Um, so we're always trying to integrate technology as well. Um, there's our chickens. There they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and our, you know, we do a seedling sale. That was from our second graders. They, they work on that. Um, we've got our greenhouse out there. We've got several different kinds of gardening experiments. So we've got some of the square foot gardening. This year we got a grant to do some hay bale gardening, which was new to us and was an epic fail. So we learned a lot about what we need to do to make it better next time. Um, and we have a great rain garden in there now that our fourth graders put in and got some national recognition for. So that was great. Good. What do you do with the produce? We eat it. Ooh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, we do taste it's on Fridays. Um, so we give the kids an opportunity to try new and different produce, new and different things. So some of it we can manage to grow ourselves, usually little cherry tomatoes or strawberries, um, salad. And then we also get produce from local farmers and, and give the kids the opportunity to, to try some different things. 
Um, and then they learn which, which things that we can save seeds from and plant again for the next year. And they learn what the chickens like to eat and find all the bugs and everything else out of there. So um, we still do our, our huge um, lunch composting thing. So the food goes to the chickens, to the worms, to the compost bin, gets recycled. And the very little bit that we have left over we call slop. And not only do we feed our chickens, but one of our families has many and um, their students take it home. But our fourth graders track all of that data. So they, they use it to learn about math, um, which is wonderful. Um, and then we're just constantly getting our kids out there and into the field and experiencing um, how the things we are learning in the classroom affect the real world. Um, just a little bit more of our whole child, our middle schoolers have been participating with the other middle schools in the county uh, for some of the tournaments that they have for volleyball. Um, basketball, track, and cross country. So that's been really exciting for them. Um, they have loved having that opportunity. Okay, so per the Maryland Charter School Law, CPCS is entitled to some academic autonomy, which you've seen in the pictures and the discussion, with high levels of accountability. And they need to be accountable with state mandated testing. So in our case, it's PARC. MSA, we had that last year, it's phased out now, and HSA. And Chesapeake Public Charter st School students have the same opportunities for traditional classes to prepare for high school. So if our middle schools offer algebra, they must offer algebra as well, so that children have ev uh, equitable opportunity. Um, they use the state predictor data and local data. They use many of our same predictor data assessments to monitor the progress and to adjust their instruction. And the local and state data has consistently suggested, indicated that they are performing as well or better than our historically highest achieving schools. And that applies to elementary and middle school. Um, this year for state assessments, um, MSA for, or last year, I'm sorry, 1314 MSA for grades three to eight. They piloted the park sixth grade English language um, arts uh, performance based assessment at the end of year. The HSA for algebra. Their test history is extremely successful, and their MSA HSA results did show growth. Fiscal compliance. CPCS is audited as a portion of our St. Mary's County Public School Audit Fund 14. So Mr. Springer is here. For operation and activities, there were no significant concerns noted in 1314. The Charter School Alliance has an independent accountant compilation, and that's reported by ASCII, ASCII, and Associates, and there were no concerns noted. Um, the governance structure, Chesapeake Charter School Alliance, we have our um, leadership of that organization here. They hold the contract with St. Mary's County Public Schools. They are responsible for fiscal and fiduciary compliance to the charter. Renewal negotiations between the Alliance and St. Mary's County Public Schools begin in January of this year and are now complete. We have a new contract that we're proposing to you that will go into effect with your, with your consent and approval September 10th, 2014 through June 30th of 2019. So it's a five year term will now include semi-annual reports to the Board of Education. So instead of coming back once a year, we're going to come back um, at least twice a year. And the Chesapeake um, Charter School Alliance meets monthly and they work collaboratively with the school administration. And certainly if they need me to come in for any reason, I'm always happy to go and, and typically do that throughout the year. Okay, the building acquisition plan. It's a plan. Um, it's still in process, but we're getting ever closer. We did sign a new five-year lease with our landlord just in case, so we finished that, and I believe it's headed up to MSDE for their approval as per usual. Um, we are planning to purchase the whole building um, through the USDA Rural Facilities Loan Application. Um, we are very excited to work with them and they with us, and we are hoping to have the paperwork signed and the funds obligated to us prior to September 30th. So it has moved up the chain um, to the highest level at this point in time in the USDA, and that's where it's sitting waiting for the authorization. Um, so when we get that loan, um, 
eventually in years to come, we would be able to modify our building and potentially increase just by one more class per grade level. So a third kindergarten, third, in, and just build that up year by year by year, um, starting with K. Um, we do have, we have retained a lawyer, Will Dubois. He's worked with us through this process of negotiating the first renewal. Um, he's helped us with um, portions of the second renewal and his firm is also guiding us through this process with the USDA just to make sure everything is in compliance with each other. Um, and Ed O'Mealy has been aware of our plans and has asked a lot of good questions and, and so that has been nice to just everybody to be on the same page. Um, <clears throat> The best part about it is that once we own the building, we won't have to pay such a significant rent. So the money that comes out of our PPA to pay rent every month um, will likely be half of what we've got now set aside for a mortgage, and then that can go to kids. So that's right. the most important part right there. So we are very excited about that and very excited about having the space and being able to kind of build it out and stretch ourselves out and, and make it more of a school and less of an office building, which is what it was originally kind of designed to be. So we're very excited about all that. Um, and then we still do go through all of the same AHERA inspections and everything else that any public school has to go through, um, and we've never had any issues with that. So we don't anticipate that being any problem with a building purchase either. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll, I'll talk for you. Um, so every year the Charter School Alliance um, does a lot of fundraising because we do a lot of neat and different things and we need a lot of help in order to make our programs run smoothly. Um, our yearly goal is $65,000. Um, last year, this is kind of last year's um, fundraising totals, was about 44000 and that was to support the programs in the building. Um, but we kind of split it out, and 17 of that was raised specifically for the building fund. So we knew we were going to incur some costs with lawyers and um, architects and things of that nature. So we wanted to start a capital campaign to help us with um, those funds as well. So the combined total was close to where we wanted it to be at 61000 And um, through their uh, savings account and bank account and everything else, they had about 114000 at the end of fiscal year 14. So that's where they are with that. Okay, this is your slide. Yeah, how about that? Yes. <laughs> All right, let me start you off, okay. Mr. Asky. Um, the Charter School Alliance is compelled to have 501c3 nonprofit status. And as you're aware, um, the previous accountant from the Charter School Alliance, who was working in a pro bono capacity, completed the form, the proper forms. Um, in the late spring, the Alliance was contacted, Mrs. Daly was the treasurer by the IRS, saying that there was some kind of problem with the filing. Um, CPC, uh, Chesapeake, Chub Chesapeake Charter School Alliance actually contacted ASCII and ASCII for some guidance and help and they are now handling the matter. So um, what I would like you to know, and we'll have Mr. Askey come up and answer any questions, that upon receiving the notice from the IRS, they initially thought there's some kind of mistake because they had paperwork to say it had been submitted. They then contacted um, Askey and Askey. They immediately disclosed it to us. Um, the 5013C um, retroactive reinstatement is sought. They've also sought the counsel of the Maryland Association of Nonprofit Organizations, which the Alliance is a member. Um, the 990 forms have been correctly filed by Mr. Askey, and they have updated their application. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask Mr. <laughs> Askey to come up and address this issue and where we are in the process. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. The IRS initially sent their notice of revocation in March of this year. And in August, we received a letter, the uh, Alliance received a letter from the IRS stating that they had received the fee and the reapplication. And if everything was okay, we would know in 90 days we would have reinstatement apply. Uh, if 
they have any questions, it could take beyond 180 days. But in all honesty, the application that they put together with our oversight only was probably the most complete application I've seen for a 501c3. I do not feel that there will be any likelihood that they will not get redetermination as a 501c3 in very short order. And what that means to them simply is that they're off the list on the IRS's website as a, an organization that would be capable of receiving uh, tax deductible contributions. Uh, when they receive the redetermination letter, it's retroactive. So it's as if nothing happened. What has occurred in this case we see happen probably more frequently than it should uh, in a situation like this where they're being compliant with the regulations other than the simple filings of the forms, everything is pretty easy to fix. It's just taking the time that needs to be taken with IRS. So happy to answer any questions you may have with respect to that issue. Okay. Uh, board members, are there any questions I must ask you at this time, Ms. Allen? Uh, um, uh, with respect to having uh, n another local nonprofit that doesn't have a f any, at least that you've shared with us or that I understand any formalized relationship with the Charter Alliance, uh, how are you going to ensure that any monies that come in are documented and then a trip and then go to the Charter Alliance? And and Mr. Burkhouse, in terms of the legalities of this, are there any things that about which the board should be concerned? Um, My understanding is is everyone that donated money received notice in writing. And that they have the option of either rescinding the donation and later making it when um, the, the the reinstatement comes in, or they can uh, donate the funds uh, to another entity. Um, can you speak to that, sir? Do you want to speak to the Maryland Association of Nonprofit Attorneys and uh, Citizen Center? Well, the the idea of the sponsorship organization collecting the funds as long as there's an accounting procedure in place to show that the monies that come in to this organization on behalf of the charter, uh, Chesapeake Charter School are then uh, moved over to the charter school. That's a part of our process and just making sure that what comes in, we deal with both. Um, the, uh, the sponsorship organization is not something new with respect to the IRS. It's, we're not creating a new animal out there. It, we're kind of following what the IRS has said. Here's what you can do if and when you do, or, or when you do not have your determination letter yet, and it's not out there on their website that, that your, uh, the public's donations are tax deductible. You can use this sponsorship organization, which is a 501c3. They can make their contributions. It is tax deductible. It's just that that funding comes from one 501c3 over to what will be another once the uh, redetermination is made by the IRS. I, I just know that there are often conversations about pass-throughs and the appropriateness of pass-throughs and the legalities of pass-throughs. Um, with I, you know, I'm I'm looking at the Rotary Foundation and money's going to them and then coming to um, uh, coming to the Rotary Club. So I'm um, and, and I'm not familiar with the Synthesis Center of St. Mary's. Can someone explain to me? Uh, what that organization is and um, uh, the only thing because we do work with the synthesis center mm -hmm. they are a client the only thing I can tell you uh, that I'm, I'm uh, free to say is that they are a uh, 501c3 organization with the Internal Revenue Service so they are tax exempt uh, and they have agreed to act as a sponsor, sponsorship organization to collect funds and pass them through. I know that the, the situation that, that you described with respect to any or some other organizations right. out there that might, uh, for example, uh, 
some organization may collect monies on behalf of a family over the radio because of some uh, emergency in the family, and they say it's tax deductible, and it isn't. In this situation, you're giving to a 501c3, who then is a part of their charter, has the right to gift or, or move that money over to another 501c3. So it's, it's not something that, as I said, it's not something we're creating. Right. Uh, it, it, there's, there uh, is some history there mm -hmm. to this set of circumstances. And I'll just I'll re rehash the fact that I have very little concern that, that this we're going to meet this 90 day and right. get a letter that mm -hmm. says I can't guarantee it obviously but right. uh, it, it is one of the best applications that I've reviewed. I, well, I I guess I Can would I have one thing sure to just to uh, when we first came across this situation, um, the Maryland Association of Nonprofits was the organization um, and their lawyer told us, this is what you can do. This is how you can have a, a fiscal sponsor. It needs to be a 501c3 and their mission has to involve education. And so that's really all that's needed. We're, we're kind of just using their EIN number. Our missions don't overlap, they don't align, we're not doing business for them, they're not doing business for us, but they can accept the money and then give it to us in the form of a grant. And we do have a, a written legal um, document signed with them so that everything is on the up and up and we have um, fiscal procedures in place um, so that everything is very transparent. Mm -hmm. It's all in you know different accounts and you know you can see where our double one is and then it gets passed over so I think um, it's if I can add that we sat at the table with the Charter School Alliance we had their attorney on conference call we had Mr. Askey at the table our internal team and Mr. O'Mealy making sure that this was all um, absolutely appropriate legal everybody had a clear understanding and again what uh, the point I want to make is anyone that gave um, made a donation to the charter school. They were given three options in writing. It could be refunded, they could leave it as it was and potentially pay taxes on it, or it could be routed through the synthesis center. So people did have a choice and they were contacted um, in writing and there's documentation of all of those letters as well. I have a greater degree of comfort based on what you've said. I, I would still, though, because I've never heard of the Synthesis Center of St. Mary's, um, and I respect the fact, Mr. Askey, that you're not able to share a great deal with us, but I would think that as an organization, presumably within St. Mary's, that we could at least perhaps have some information about who they are, what their mission is, um, just to better understand uh, what they're about and, sure. and I, I appreciate the fact that they've partnered with you to make this happen and that you have um, a, a signed agreement with them and you have safeguards in place. I, it, it's I, a credibility issue as well, you know, in terms of just understanding sure, who they sure. are. Correct. It, it's, it's, I've just never heard of them before and I, I'd be interested to know um, who they are and what they're about. Sure. You, you mentioned that you have um, uh, some degree of, of alignment with mission in terms of education, I, I'd just be interested to understand more about that. So. Sure. I mean, I'm sure I can get, you know, pieces of their incorporating documents and, and just forward that on to you. That's probably or, the best way to do it, I think. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. However it works. But thank you. Okay. This is okay. This is our renewal timeline. As I said, we started in January. Um, we're hoping to be finished by June, but we had this issue that we needed to really work through and make sure that we had everything taken care of. But you can see some samples of all the different times that we met, and there were a lot of additional meetings that took place. We made sure that we had all the different players from the school system. Human resources was at the table, facilities was at the table, transportation, to make sure that we really did a thorough job. Um, here's the contract renewal piece. It is a five-year contract because that is what the state is recommending. Um, and it would go through June 30th of 2019. HR certification requirements stay the same. There are no waivers. Everyone must be fully certificated for the area in which they are employed. 
Achievement standards will be the same as all public schools. Now we're sort of in a fluid time. Um, they're going to be in a fluid time right along with us. So the standard will stay the same. Um, transportation is purchased. They have budgeted $150,000 um, for the, the bus service that they provide. Food services will continue. They have a continued commitment to their mission. And um, there's an adjustment to the Chesapeake Ch Charter School Alliance's reporting structure to the Board of Education, as I've already mentioned. We're going to do it more often. There was a substantial change to the per pupil allocation calculation. It is much more delineated. In your contract, it's 38.0 and it goes through a step-by-step -step process. Um, the legal counsel for both parties agree with that. And just as an aside, um, we have recently been um, a part of a Maryland legislative study through the University of Baltimore, the Schaefer Center, about charter schools. And um, your group, the, the school-based group, met and did their interview. Mr. Springer and I met, and it was all about how do you calculate the PPA? So this is obviously, we're just ahead of the curve a little bit. We actually, I got an email from them tonight saying, we'd like you to come and talk to us about what you're doing. Um, but we have a detailed calculation and a timeline for the per pupil allocation. Again, we're gonna move it forward a little bit. And um, Mrs. Fanyo is going to adjust the lottery just because we think that gives them a little more time to make decisions. Special education will be managed by the Chesapeake Public Charter School. Mrs. Charbonnet is absolutely fine with that. Again, all employees are going to be uh, vetted through HR, and so they'll have all of the proper credentialing. But that will give um, the charter school a little more flexibility. Teachers and service provider salaries will be bought back, that's special ed, and the allocation will be paid directly to the Alliance on a quarterly basis. At Here's a copy of the completed contract. Um, the evaluation of Chesapeake Public Charter School standards, <coughs> academics, human resources and staffing, facilities, finance, their governance structure, their contractual compliance. We believe that they are in good standing as they have been over the last um, really 10 years. And so um, our next step, we are going to ask you to please carefully consider and review the information provided as well as the contract. There are also um, copies of the contract on the back table for anyone interested in reviewing it. It's our intent to bring this back on September 10th um, for your hopeful approval and signature. And we are available to take any questions and the Alliance um, leadership is here if you'd like to speak to them. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hall. Uh, questions, comments? Mrs. Allen, do you have any more to? Um, I, just a few comments. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, uh, I continue to, to hear and see wonderful things about the charter school. I think it's been a wonderful partnership. Um, I think I was, we were all surprised when we encountered the glitch that um, brought us, brought us, um, you know, uh, a bit past where we would normally be in terms of, of um, completing the contract and, and signing off the charter renewal. Um, it just seems to have been a year for hiccups. Um, and, uh, and I also really like the idea that you've suggested about the earlier lottery to give people more time to plan and determine what their next steps are. Um, I think that what I hear from parents who aren't able to get into the charter school is extreme frustration over the fact that, you know, here's a school and, and there's only 17 spots this year that they can get into. Um, it makes it very difficult to kind of break into and become a part of that school. Um, and, and as I said, that's, that's probably the overwhelming thing I hear from, from parents who, who um, make comments. Um, your expansion plans, um, you know, this is something we've heard about for a while. Um, I know that there are other tenants that are a part of that building, and in fact, I, I may not be correct about the title, but the Health Enterprise Zone office that's 
going in there. I know um, at a meeting I attended recently at the hospital, they were speaking to the fact that they're making renovations to their space, to the space there, and, and how they envision that being utilized. Um, what feedback are you getting from the other tenants? Are they aware um, that you are pursuing uh, purchasing the building and, and expanding into greater spaces and, and how, how will that work? Um, to some degree, yes. In fact, um, D Dr. Benner's office, they already moved out and over to, to um, Solomon's because they, they were like, well, the charter school is going to buy it and we just have to go find another place. So this was like, what, three months ago. Um, but then we went to the landlord and said, because there was another issue with the USDA, um, in order for us to receive that funding, we have to be very careful about the tenants that are there. We can, they can only occupy 25% 20, 20, of the building space um, in order for us to, to get the loan. Um, so we met with the landlord and we said, we know that these certain tenants are scheduled to phase out in September of 2014. Um, would you consider going month to month with those tenants until we've got a solid handle on this? And so he was taking that up with them to say, hey, this is you know looking more and more likely. We don't know when, so that's the hard part for everybody, but if they at least have some notice um, that that's going to happen. and then. We also heard that they would be putting another um, hospital building, like on the corner where Cherry Cove is, and that the, the people that are in there now would potentially be moving in that direction. But we're also okay with right now keeping them as tenants and using some of the revenue that would be made from them to just to help maintain the building um, until we kind of get our footing with how this all will work, being landlords ourselves. So. Um, that's our plan right now, is to just sit tight for this first year of, you know, getting the building, and that, <clears throat> and then we'll be determining based on our need to build out maybe just K to, a little K to two section of the building at first. So we it fully intend to do it in stages, mm -hmm. um, and to keep some of those tenants around as long as we can, to help with um, common area maintenance and those kinds of things. And I also appreciate the fact that within the contract, there's language in there with respect to the. The, the mm -hmm. um, possible purchase of the building and, and mm -hmm. um, a, any outcome with that that would be. Um, so I, I greatly appreciate that that was added. Mrs. Allen, if, um, if they are successfully able to buy the building, and we believe they will be, we do intend to come back as an information item, show you the plans, um, kind of give you an update. You know, right now, you know, the goal was to get the charter signed so that we can continue while this, this continues to to play out. Uh, we'll get the IRS situation resolved, they'll buy the building, but then we plan to come back with a, a pretty detailed, you know, a map so that you can see exactly what their plans are, so on and so forth. Okay? I know at one time, um, as we initially approved the charter, we also saw their lease, but um, I think that must have adjusted because we've not. Well, I think that we signed it with the landlord and it goes to MSDE and then they send it back as approved right. and then you all or, or it's yes, it's so it's that it's it's on its way. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. That's all my questions. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Mrs. Watson. Thank you, Dr. Rasma. I applaud your efforts of continuous improvement <coughs> in your processes and your academics, your accountability, and your capital projects measures. For example, you're relooking your application process. So if a student is placed on the wait list, the parent will have uh, other options that they can consider. Also, that you will report to the Board of Education at least twice yearly versus once a year. That you're using ASCII and ASCII to handle your accounting and uh, legal issues. And that you have established um, a building fund uh, for your capital project. And once you noticed there was a glitch in your 5013C, you find the legally acceptable way to accept donations. It appears to be legal. All attorneys were at the table. Right. The Ms. SMCPS yes, attorney, the CPS attorney, the sensitive center attorney. And also you have uh, allocated funding for your transportation. And overall, I hear wonderful things about your school from the citizens and your wait list of over 200 students is a commentary that you are a school that is highly desirable. 
So um, thank you for all that you do. I remember when this effort first started, you have come a very long way. And I also look forward to hearing more about your capital project of purchasing the building. Now, right there with the students, is that, are they in the shape of CPCS mm -hmm. exclamation, exclamation mark? Yes. CP, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> that is uh, very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Boyce. Mr. Matthews. Yes, thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for the big turnout. Thank you. <laughs> We're all behind you. You're doing a great job. Uh, I do have one, a couple questions about the Synthesis Center. Um, and I'm glad that they're able to route everything to you. Are they charging a fee for that, or is that just a nice no. bonus? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Askey. <laughs> <laughs> is he pro bono, too? Nope. <laughs> well, I got you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we uh, learned uh, our I'll lesson. Push that, but thanks for showing up tonight. Didn't mean to put it there. But um, keep up the good work, Does that guys. Even exist anymore? I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Cross. Yes, again, uh, ditto. You are doing a great job. I was there for um, the first day of school, and the kids were all excited. And then I got to see my neighbor. Mrs. Leopold and her kindergarten class Great. and all yeah. that. Did you, they were all having a good time, including the teacher. That's even better. And um, can't do anything more other than somehow get a bigger school or get a school that we could, maybe, maybe another charter school. I don't know what the answer is. Put them all in STEM. Mm -hmm. I, we got to somehow, you know, when you can meet needs in smaller environments, because you've got that 20. That or 20 point whatever, that is also very important. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you very much. And you know what that one question I asked was, <laughs> but we won't talk about that now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll clone you Next. and then we'll worry about it <laughs> some other time. Thank you, Mrs. Crosby. Serena? I do not have any comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, one, just one thing. Uh, everything's moving along very well, apparently. Mm -hmm. Mr. O'Mealy has been involved yes, in sir. all these discussions right on through. Mm -hmm, I'm assuming that. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And if you look in the binder that we prepared for you, you see meeting notes and you will see Mr. O'Mealy's signature on the sign in sheets. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Dr. Moderato, you. Uh, yeah, I've been waiting and just listening um, <laughs> you know, to make some comments. So, good evening, everybody. Great to see all of you here this evening. Uh, I appreciate Mrs. Washington taking the words right out of my mouth. You've come a long, I, we do that often to each other. You've come a long way, baby, you know, in, in that sense. Uh, I mean, I, I think about it in a very historical, reflective mode. The very first day on the job as superintendent in 2005, I want you to understand this, uh, after a very, I guess, a contentious process, I would say, uh, it was taken to the state board for appeal. It was remanded back. Uh, for approval. I was given direction by this board, Mr. Superintendent, to figure this out. The very first action uh, that I advanced to the Board of Education, we went through a very, as you remember, a very thorough and detailed vetting uh, through that process uh, with all kinds of visuals, stoplights, approval process. Because if you remember what we said, at the time there were not a lot of great models out there for charter schools. There just weren't. Uh, for success that we could turn to. Many of them were failing in a variety of different ways, uh, from financial support to buildings. So that was a big question in terms of facilities. Uh, the, the distinction and the delineation of an instructional program that separated it out as something different and unique, again, following the basic school model. Um, the, the whole conversation about that, we said clearly that we wanted it to be successful. We wanted it to be at the level of high level of um, Fidelity is our other schools in our school district, which has a very high level of expectation. And we wanted it to be successful so that we weren't revisiting it, you know, in years to go down the road where we were revoking the charter. Uh, we've gone through several charter renewals uh, processes. Uh, we've kept Kelly as a consistent variable as my hand-picked representative uh, to be involved in the process, which is a very unique model. Uh, to have the leadership of the school system involved at the level of intimacy of which she's done. And you've done a, 
a tremendous job, Kelly, of representing uh, our school district, representing me uh, in my absence of that, as well as in keeping me informed, which in turn I was able to keep the board informed. Uh, the, it, it has exceeded expectation uh, in, in many ways, uh, and, and I think that you've recognized the fact of how large of an advocate I've been. And I know, uh, Ms. Fonya, you get tired of hearing me say this over and over, but I make points for a reason so that they stick as a good teacher for re the repetitive nature is that um, we, we wanted it to be successful and when you and I had the conversation about the model that we were implementing for reform in this district when we first uh, worked together regarding a vision, a revision of reform, a vision of choice, a choice-based program, I firmly believe my educational philosophy that quality school systems offer choice because no student learns on the same way on the same day Opportunities have to be presented to students to acknowledge their gifted areas, following the multiple intelligence issues of uh, Howard Gardner. All children are gifted, and we pull that out. And, and bringing out the nurturing, focused in terms of how you've approached things has really met that need, in addition to our myriad of choice-based options that we have across our district. Over 10 percent uh, of our students are involved in choice-based options, and additionally to our very strong uh, schools that we have already in place in terms of our comprehensive schools. So when it fit in that choice-based model, it's, it's, it's replicated in terms of our overall pathways model. It's a pathway that we acknowledge and we support. Uh, I, I also have been intrigued over those 10 years because there's been great opposition, depending upon the circle of which individuals travel, uh, pros and cons uh, on the debate of charter schools. Uh, I remember that Jay Matthews did a very uh, interesting uh, article in the Washington Post on us, and it was, the headline was, yikes a charter school friendly superintendent like it was some kind of anomaly uh, you know for the nation to embrace but when you put it in the framework of choice it starts making sense at a different level not as just a different model that's going to scoop up uh, in a, in, 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 you know, and make the other schools disappear it's not a competitive mode by no means do we view this as competition it is just another opportunity for young people uh, to find a different environment that meets their needs. It's not for everybody. You've, you and I have had that conversation. Uh, it's very tailor-made, but also very specific in the sense that there's other choice-based models there as well. So the, the, the jewels in that big crown called St. Mary's County Public School System exists uh, in, in a way to meet those needs of all of our young people. And we can't ask for anything any better than that. So we've come a long way. Uh, you have. The, the, the way that the, that the school has thrived continues to just uh, amaze me because uh, many of you know in terms of when I talk about the educational philosophies, I talk about the 21st century skills and you know, behind you on that wall you see the 21st century skills that I always talk about. A major component of that is, is providing constant opportunities uh, for creativity and innovation. Uh, you know, as I keep, you know, e each year there's a, an additional level of innovation. Just looking at those pictures of the garden you know, and how that's laid out. I remember when we were, you know, that was first getting off the ground and the struggles for that, mm -hmm. you know, up in the field behind there, you know, and just having just semblances of a variety of different things. But how that through persistence and that vision of innovation, uh, that's the spark of Americans' education uh, that really separates us out uh, in that sense. So I am so proud, quite frankly, of the work that's occurring there uh, at your school. I'm so proud of the overall efforts for the students. Uh, it is a model that I carry with me in my heart and carry often in my conversations and speeches and talks that I give to other educators about the model of which we've embraced. But again, when I say all of that, don't become complacent. You know, as I'm giving wise advice here, don't become complacent in, in the sense that things are just wonderful. The high level of accountability has to be there. You're venturing now into some new and unchartered territory uh, of buying your own building. I mean, there's, a, there's some inherent risk with that. You've got to make certain, you know, as the board continues to monitor that, that we're, that we're very judicious and very uh, straightforward in terms of what that entails and what that looks like and feels like. I mean, we want this to be successful, but down the road, if this whole leadership team changes in a variety of things, it doesn't take much in education for things to start going in different directions when shifts in leadership occur. What systems, what I'm now concerned about 10 years later, is the sustainability for the long term. So as I look back into the organization year to year, I want to see the charter school being successful and continuing to thrive. 
and any inclination that that foundation is cracking in any way that we put in place uh, measures to hold that up. Because these are not experiments. We had conversations about this. And I think it's important to continue this conversation. These are not experiments. These are dollars that have been allocated to advance an educational agenda that is innovative and meets the needs of our young people. And it's not something we just throw dollars at, say, oh, we'll try this, and if it doesn't work, then the next year we'll take it over and take it back. But no, the dollars are precious, and our students are in experiments in that sense as well. And so the work that you've done, you've really, really uh, broken the mold in terms of the, the educational delivery model, uh, which I'm so enamored with in terms of innovation, doing things different to get better results, and you've just hit every cylinder of what uh, I value in terms of the educational process of what, what all children in America should be uh, engaged with. So combined with all the other offerings that we have in St. Mary's County, congratulations. The board will bring this forward. Uh, you'll bring this forward for action. They have been extremely, as I can continue to refer to them as the ultimate governing body working with the Alliance. Uh, they, you, they have a tremendous role in terms of the accountability of this and their direction to me has been uh, palpable as well as persistent uh, during our time of working together to ensure that level of sustainability and success and high level of, of, uh, of quality. So congratulations. Uh, I, I'm very proud of this work. Uh, and you've done a, a, just a tremendous job from the very beginning. Uh, a couple of you have been with the program from the beginning, right? I know you have. Julia Nichols. Uh, I know that for a fact. And it's, it's, it's very satisfying. You know, it, it doesn't it represent the best in terms of when parents all collaborate together. It's the, the old Margaret Mead quote, you know, never doubt what a small group of thoughtful individuals can do, change the world, you know, in that sense. And you've really changed the delivery model. And we're the only one in Southern Maryland. You know, in that sense, and, and, and I, I talk about you uh, all, all the time, you know, in the sense of a very positive approach towards the innovative educational experience for young people. So, Dr. Rasp, thank you for allowing me to go on a little longer because this one is uh, very significant. Uh, we've all had a vested interest in this, and uh, you've been successful. Uh, so, uh, Mrs. Washington said you've come a long way. Uh, you've come a long way, and you're thriving. And just by virtue of pictures worth a thousand words, those pictures are phenomenal where you see those activities. And, and, and I love your building. I, mean, I, love the, I love walking in your school. I mean, I just love being there. I love walking in all schools. But I mean, there's a real, there's a real culture mm -hmm. and a real good feeling and a good vibe when you walk in there. It's in your gut. You know good things are happening there. Kids are responsive. They're happy. Mm -hmm. They're engaged. And they're, they're doing some really innovative things. So congratulations. So thank you, Dr. Rest, for allowing me to speak yes. at that. Yes. You will bring us back for an action item at the next board meeting. Yes, sir. And proceed. So back to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Monterano. Are the tennis courts still in the building? <laughs> no. See, I remember, I remember when it was built, yeah, long, 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 long time ago, and it was a tennis club. It was a tennis club. It was a beautiful club. The building still is a beautiful building, and uh, we play a lot of tennis uh, in 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 there and uh, in, in uh, other sports that were sponsored at that time. It's unfortunate. Uh, that it just didn't, you know, take off uh, like it should have. I guess the community just didn't support it at that time, and that's good for you and us because we have a charter school now over there. So that is great, absolutely great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support. We'll see you on September 10th. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we'll be by to visit with the yes. chickens. <laughs> I'm not going to be getting an Easter chicken. <laughs> chicken. Not, <bad. laughs> All right. not anymore. Yeah, We're done with for this one. Hey, Pete, this is all sure. around. Well, there. Okay, uh, next information item uh, first day of school. <coughs> Ms. Okay. Hall and uh, Mr. Scott Smith. Okay, here we go. Um, thank you very much. All my paperwork. Thank you. Hey, we're going to talk to you about the opening of the new school year. We have some new administrators this year. We have Mr. Michael Egan has been appointed the principal of the Dr. James A. Forrest Career and Technology Center. 
and Mr. Jeffrey Dorenzo, who is currently the principal of Mechanicsville Elementary, has been appointed principal of Captain Walter Francis Duke Elementary School. He is extraordinarily excited. Here's our new teacher update from HR. We have 74 new teachers hired for the 14-15 school year. Currently, there are six vacancies, and it's actually probably less than that from the time we put this into board docs. Um, we have over 2,600 active teacher applications on file. Uh, early bird sessions were offered for our new teachers. We had model demonstration classes, lots of professional development, and a three-day orientation for new teacher hires in collaboration with EASMC. The Early Childhood Pathway and Pre-K. We have 720 pre-kindergarten students uh, seats available. The cap is 20 students per session, unless, of course, we have an income-eligible child that comes in after that, and then we're compelled by law to accept that student. There are currently, at the time of this, 26 children on a waiting list, and we are, um, those, it's less than that now, and those children were all being offered a space, if not in their home school and neighboring school. We're working to accommodate daycare requests, and some pre-K students will be transferred if, um, to a desired school if that works for the families. Um, our early childhood pathway for Head Start, there are 174 spaces available in Head Start. Um, currently, we have 166 children enrolled. 60 children are in full-day sessions. It says 126 are in half-day session. That includes preschool special education children that come into the classroom with support and Head Start began on our first day this year of August 20th. Transportation, uh, Mr. Thompson provided this information to us that the regular bus route information was available online. They did their dry run practice on August 18th. Um, transportation worked with us throughout the spring and the summer to arrange for Head Start um, students and students needing special transportation. And we're very grateful to them for their help. Here they come. Excited students grabbed their book bags and headed for, um, for school. That's Evergreen down on the bottom. And um, one of our, uh, that's Fairlee. Over 18,140 students were met by their eager teachers. Our school supply list, we had standardized supply lists with two teacher choices. So there was some flexibility for teachers. They were online, in, newspaper, in newsletters, in local businesses. We had it available in multiple languages. We tried to be as cost sensitive as we could. Um, system was in place for those with financial hardships, as you mentioned today in your board report, Mrs. Mrs. Washington. PTA, PTO, we encourage our schools to participate in some kind of parent-teacher organization, just because we know when parents are involved, children just do better, and we welcome that. Um, so we foster that collaborative spirit. It benefits students. It builds um, strong bridges between home and school, and we want to strengthen those relationships. Then Mr. Smith is going to talk to you about technology for this school year. Thank you very much, Ms. Hull. Um, technology, and we're joined by uh, Mr. David Howard. He's back for the second board meeting, and we really should uh, recognize that um, because I just wanted to summarize how much technology we really do have out in our schools. Uh, 6,400 laptops, 6,300 desktops, 5,500 iPads, over 1,000 smart boards, about 180 MacBooks. So we're, we have multiple platforms out there. We have 300 megabits of, of total bandwidth, 10 gig fiber to all sites. We're doing voice over internet protocol phones. It, uh, so far we have 10 and we're gonna go up. And uh, this summer's work was moving over to Windows 7 on all of our machines, which we will have completed by December 14th and then hopefully be able to deploy software centrally by February of 2015. Um, as we all know, Mr. Corns left us in June, and for the second half of June and all of July, um, the programmer analysts, the project managers, the project coordinators, all the computer specialists, they uh, really stepped up over the summer, many of them working quite autonomously, and I really want to give a shout out to all of them for the work that was done. And then, of course, for Mr. Howard coming in and uh, very quickly stepping right in the middle of it and, and wrangle it all out, because technology is one of the most rewarding and perhaps one of the most frustrating parts of all teachers' day. So. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Continue to come to board meetings. 
<laughs> um, as, we, as we well know and we've deployed over the last two years, most successfully in the last year particularly, uh, we, had a, we had our Twitter feeds, our Twitter, we were tweeting all over the place. People could follow, um, even if you weren't able to get out to your child's school, you could very much monitor the Twitter feed and, and see the people in the, in the building visiting with children. It was really a fantastic interactive tool and uh, Dr. Martirano has really institutionalized that element of communication in our county. Um, we've had a lot of fun with Facebook. Um, people were posting their pictures, their first day pictures to Facebook. It's now been picked up by other news agencies and things like that, but they're, they're following our lead. Um, we just had some of the greatest pictures and the, the one on the top with the mother and holding the <laughs> child and not letting it go. <laughs> they, we, they, were, they, were all, they were really, 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 they were really, really, really cute. Um, school meals, once again, we are online. Uh, My School Bucks, you can go in there and load up all of those uh, accounts and our, our parents are obviously utilizing that to a great deal of success. School information, all of our web pages. Last summer we went through the big lift of, of uh, making the platforms uniform throughout so you could navigate the same no matter which uh, school site you, are, you were on. They have integrated Google calendars with events that parents can subscribe to. There's an incredible amount of information that the school uh, Twitter feed can be accessed on the home page. So there's a lot of information that's there. Many of our homes have been lit up night after night. I have three boys in the system. Let me assure you the school messenger phone system works exceptionally well and then it follows it up with a nice email to my house in the event that one of my children hung up the phone um, there's you can't say that we're not getting our word out there um, and we've gone through everything e e uh, and uh, eSchool Plus eSchool Plus home access center we did not have any complaints this year now last year we did struggle a bit because we told them the exact start time we were going to turn on hack this year we got really smart and we turned it on and we didn't tell anybody and then the next day we put a Facebook message that said hey hack is on and then the actual day that it was supposed to be on the majority of people had already accessed they also did a great deal of work on the back end to set up multiple servers for eSchool and home access center a lot of technical stuff that I can't I don't really understand, but it worked. Mm -hmm. And everybody was able to go in there. Again, we have institutionalized a parent's ability to see in real time what's going on with their children, the assignments that they have, the attendance. Um, my middle, my, he's not a middle schooler anymore, he's a freshman. On, uh, on Friday, he was unlawfully absent to his fourth period class. So I sent a polite email to the teacher and found out that indeed it was just a, a marking error and indeed he hadn't skipped the class. But uh, he knows that all eyes are on and uh, it's, a fantastic, it's a fantastic tool and our parents use it very well, do they not? Yes, they do, and you, and you love it, and you love the fact that they can in real time know whether or not you were late to your fourth period class. Uh, we want to take this opportunity once again at the beginning of, of the year, and we're going to be stressing it throughout the month of September. Um, absences, in the event that your child is absent, you must contact the school, and you can do it in a multitude of ways. You may phone the school, you may have the child bring in a signed letter, you may present yourself at the school, or you may go to the school website and go through the simple online reporting tool that can be found on that, on that uh, landing page because we need to have all of our students, if they are absent, to be marked lawfully absent so that we know that you are aware of where they are because the state of Maryland has a very strict habitual truancy law where less than 1% of all students can be habitually truant in one year. So we really do spend a great deal of time monitoring that and Dr. Ridgell uh, could certainly speak uh, to that at, at length as that is a, a central piece of, of his work in student services. So that's a wonderful part. We are looking forward to another great year. Uh, several conversations with Dr. Martirano and Mr. Clements and, and Mrs. McCord as we're, or as we're sitting here, we're saying, well, what's going on? It's such a quiet opening. It's really, <laughs> things, are, things are going really, really well. So I think, that, I think that that's a testament to the way we interact with our parents and our students and everybody knows it's, it is indeed, as you've all attested, business on the very first day. So with that, Thank you very much. Very good. Taking question? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. <laughs> okay. Questions or comments? <coughs> Sarita? Um, I definitely think that was good that you opened Hack early. Uh, I remember one of my friends texted me and was like, what's your schedule? I'm like, it's not supposed to open until tomorrow. But So that definitely um, eliminated issues of hack crashing or Waiting. Crashing, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or waiting a few hours to um, log in. 
Um, but yes, as you were saying, it's a um, good start to the school year. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Crud. I think all of your technology is just terrific and looks like nobody can go anywhere without being watched. I know you do. Make I sure, have a little sure pen on myself. Sure no. Good to go. <laughs> you got to. Mm -hmm. That's right, Mrs. Corsi. When you drive down a the highway, they're watching us. There's no question. The camera's right. all over the place. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Matthews. Great job. Happy first day. Happy, happy. happy people. Thank you very much. Mrs. Marsh. I thank everyone for working so hard to ensure that we would have a smooth opening of the first day of school. It didn't happen by accident. It just did not randomly happen. It was planned. And it took a lot of planning. Um, teachers, parents, uh, administrators, support staff, and community. Everyone worked together. And we have a good team at mm -hmm. St. Mary's County Public Schools to make it work. Everybody worked together. Students were fed, um, they were eating breakfast with their teachers, the buses were running, students were happy, they knew where to go. It was, the buildings were sparkling. It was, oh, and it was a beautiful day. It was a sunny day, and I was out there giving the students a high five. And it, that's, a lot of this work is done in the summer and throughout the year. It takes almost a year to prepare for the opening of a yes, school year. It's not just, oh, it just happens. Everybody know you just show up. No, it doesn't work like that. It's a well-organized plan. And I thank you so much because there are some schools that don't open on time. We take it for granted that in St. Mary's County, we will open and we will open on time. Mm -hmm. So that's a blessing in itself. Not only does it open on time, but everybody's happy and everybody knows the expectations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moderano. Yep. Absolutely. Looks like you're getting emotional over there. No. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be I, was just, I was just thinking in terms of snow days. I don't know why that crept in my head. Well, it is emotional. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, uh, this will be your last one, like opening of school Thanks for but SM me. oh I didn't mean to hurt your feelings <laughs> it was, but yes no yeah um, no it doesn't hurt my feelings it's just very it was, I know it was it's very, emotional it was very hard uh, to visit all the students this year and say goodbye so yeah it was my 10th opening oh so, yeah, a decade yeah hmm? a decade a decade yeah absolutely oh well well we appreciate you and the efforts you, you started the uh, first day of school visits yeah. you would ride the bus with the students uh, we've been on the bus with students. Exactly. We did that too. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a really great way to welcome the students. Sure e is. Everybody's out there welcoming students and wishing, wishing, wishing them a happy and prosperous school mm -hmm. year. It shows great support. Yeah, it does show great, great. support. I, I don't know how many school systems um, do what we do. The, ride the buses, board members. Are, the, every school is yeah. covered. Community. Yeah, it's a community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. Mrs. Allen. I was uh, reflecting uh, on my visit through Leonardtown Elementary, um, the great changes that have occurred. Uh, when my children were students there and, and you know, beyond, <clears throat> all the parents and the students congregated outside those locked doors at open house until the doors were finally opened and we all, everybody went charging in to be able to, at that point, then find out which teacher did their right. children get. Right. And the ability for people, for students to know ahead of time um, is a great comfort. And I know that our open houses are incredibly well uh, attended. Um, Slightly. Uh, yes. Uh, and I, and I know that's probably somewhat of a work in progress in terms of figuring out where the ideal is of how do we, especially in some of our schools that have limited parking, um, you know, how do we make sure everybody has the opportunity to come in and, and visit um, and still keep traffic moving and cars <laughs> parked and all those wonderful things. Um, 
truly, I, I, HAP has been such a wonderful addition to the school system. Um, I, I hear about it often from parents and, and even from a lot of students. Um, they may not always like the fact that their parents can know so quickly, right. did they turn in that homework, um, or did they take that test, or how did they do on it, or were they in class when they were supposed to be. Um, it gives parents and students the opportunity to have conversations about um, their performance, their activity, and, and how they might improve if that's needed. Uh, and especially the, the fact that, as I said, they can, they can get information before they get to school um, and, uh, and start to kind of have a, a plan in place. I think that's fantastic. So um, there's a large group of people that make this happen every year. And, um, and all I can say is that um, I share with you that I hope that you will take back to all how much we appreciate the efforts that go into making every school opening as smooth as it is because it truly is not so much the norm either in the state or in the nation. And I think it is a significant testament to the dedication and the loyalty and the care that the people of St. Mary's County and especially our employees put into our schools. Um, and that's very significant because it has a lot to do with the success of our students. Thank so you. thank you. That's it, sir. Thank you, Mrs. L. And I want to give a shout out to Brad Clements. Yes. Mm -hmm. A major portion of our success for the first day of school and throughout the school year is Brad Clements and his group. He's responsible for a host of things. Food services, the students were fed. They were eating breakfast, okay? Transportation, the buses were going. Nobody was left behind. Building services, the buildings were sparkling. The floors were shiny from one end to the other. Safety and security, another thing. Everybody felt safe and secure, and so many other things that you do. But you have that whole side of the house, and it runs smoothly. And I want to thank you so much, because we couldn't have school without you. We couldn't have school if the buses weren't running. We wouldn't have school if there was no food. We couldn't have food if the buildings weren't clean. You know, because the building service workers clean every desk and every chair, every board, every everything in that school. Teachers have to take everything down because they are doing a thorough cleaning of that school. And that's good to make sure everybody's healthy, nobody gets sick, because the building is clean. So you are tremendously important to us for what you do. And we could not have school without you. You contribute to academic achievement. Hungry kids can't learn. It, you're not even thinking about learning if you're hungry. And Mr. Jones makes sure that we have programs in place, the breakfast program for students, even in the summer, lunch and learn program. So you do so many things and you are to be commended for taking care of that whole piece of the St. Mary's County Public School System. Because we cannot do it without you. You have a well-oiled machine. They, your employees know what to do and they do it well. They do it with a smile and they are always there. Cafeteria workers, what a smile. Some of our students, that's the best meal that they get, breakfast and lunch at school, and they get it with a smile. So I wanna publicly thank you for what you do. You do so much, and you are sincerely and greatly appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Washington, but there's a large group of people that make me look good. That's right, and you are the leader of that group, and leadership starts at the top. So that's very good, and I know the credit goes to you as the leader and all of the people that work under you, and that's what a good leader does. Give the kudos to the people that work for them. You shine the light on them, and I thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. Uh, <clears throat> it's not much for me to add, but I would like to say <laughs> that 
dedication, loyalty, expertise, community involvement at all levels, great staff, great administrators, great student body, constant training, happy people, having fun, and many other things that go together to make a number one school system, which we are and we sh shall, I'm using the word shall, maintain the status in the number one county, in the number one state, and everybody in this room, in the schools, in all the departments, and our community and our student body have worked very, very hard over the years to bring this school system where it is today. And I'm sure newspapers agree with that. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Moderato, as a chief leader of the school system, thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. You know, he has one more board meeting, so that's coming up. And uh, we'll have some more conversation at that time. Exactly. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. This meeting, all right. before it's adjourned, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I need wait to say, oh, wait a minute, wait. I, I need to say that the next regular meeting will be on Wednesday, September the 10th, 2014 at 9 a.m. Okay? This meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everybody.